And we are live. This is Dark Journalist. Uh, what a fantastic crowd we have out there tonight in the Ideas Room already. And of course, tonight I'm joined by the lovely Olivia. Hi, everybody. And uh, Olivia, it looks like every week now there's a new UFO office. Oh, what's the newest <laughs> one? I haven't heard this. This one is the most insane. Uh, they they came up with all this nonsense, of course, um, when they were attaching things to the National Defense Authorization Act. And we've kept a lot of steady reports uh, on this going forward, just off the chart. So what they've been doing is this this kind of hulking amount of military money that gets signed on to by the president and everybody else, both houses of Congress every year. And that's the NDAA. And what they've been doing, they used to squeeze in uh, the 9-11 emergency stuff. You know, so every president from Trump to Obama to Bush to this guy, Stepford Biden, uh, they all sign this. There's no, you know, and all the parties sign on to it. So there's really no divisions in those parties when you come down to it. In fact, it passes uh, without any dissent. It's like always 100%, 93 to zero and all that stuff. Um, and, you know, occasionally like, somebody will abstain because they're on vacation. <laughs> but basically we get the idea, you know, you know where your bread is buttered. Now, what they've been doing, the likes of Marco Rubio, the senator from Florida, uh, who tried to famously run for president in 2016 and didn't do so hot, but he's hanging out there. He's the guy who also likes the idea of bombing Iran. Nice guy. All those neocons love to bomb everything. Well, what's interesting about all this is uh, he has Kirsten Gillibrand on his side now, the senator from New York, and they attached all this to the National Defense Authorization Act last year and got this new UFO office going. And you'd think, hey, that's a good thing. But unfortunately, uh, you have two of the most blackmailable members of Congress there helming that um, <laughs> with a lot of very dicey connections. So the new one now, Pentagon renames UFO office, expands mission to include transmedium. <laughs> oh, gee, thanks. Um, so they're just going round and round. Like, you know, every couple of weeks, there's a new one. So let's read this one. After only eight months of existence, the Pentagon's office tasked with investigating and tracking UFOs or unidentified aerial phenomena, UAP, bad marketing gone wrong, will look beyond the stars for objects of interest. On Wednesday, the Pentagon announced that it renamed and expanded the authority of the government's chief UFO office, formerly known as the Airborne Object Identification and Management Group, or AIMSOG, <laughs> what a catchy title. Uh, the office will now be known as the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or ARO. So I don't know, the domain thing is gone in there, so shouldn't it be ADRO? Well, it's ARO. Um, with the new name comes increased responsibility, so new reasons to cover things up. Transmedium typically refers to the ability of an object to fly across multiple environments. Now, here's the, the real interesting trick part. The office's new scope and name results from a provision in the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal 2022. That's this year. The bill includes a provision to establish an office with responsibilities that were broader than those originally assigned in the old office, which they didn't have. So here's the interesting thing. Now, anytime they want to do something and kind of scam out on the UFO side, on the government thing, so if they want to portray this UFO threat or have the CIA run it or have Avril Haynes from uh, the DNI run it, then they just have to run it through this NDAA because it holds everyone hostage. Because if these guys complain, nobody gets their money. So this is a mechanism uh, that needs to be sussed out and because it's being exploited so badly, it needs to be splashed across the headlines everywhere because they're just going to do this with everything. But that they're doing it with the UFO file uh, and the phony UFO threat offices that they're trying to build to create this thing, that tells us, I think, a lot. So we need to keep our eyes open for that. Oddly enough, tonight's show is not even on UFOs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, this is just a bonus. Tonight's show, interestingly enough, is on Einstein and Charles Hapgood in the hot zone. That is pole shift and Atlantis rising. That's what X series 129 is going to be all about. But I do want to cover a couple of these quick things here uh, to keep us up to date on all the machinations that are going on. Everyone, you're joining us just now. We're getting started with X series 129. This is Hapgood and Einstein in the hot zone. Now, um, 
I want to, before we get started, mention that in the second half of the program, we're going to be taking questions because we have Olivia tonight. And uh, we also will do that in the second half of the program. You can ask the questions now. And while I have your attention, go to the darkjournalist.com website if you haven't already and sign up for our free newsletter that keeps us all in the loop in the days of this crazy, wild and crazy censorship, a wild and crazy guy censorship. <laughs> All right, uh, just a little bit more on this UFO tip on the government side, and then we'll jump in. The Space Force requires a Space National Guard. Okay, now famously, the Space Force got introduced as the sixth branch of the armed services under President Trump, and the idea was, hey, I'm going to get the UFO file back under executive command. Uh, and a lot of real Trump loyalists are in that organization, in fact. Uh, so Stepford Biden has stayed away from it, hasn't promoted it. So now you have all these people. In this case, these are very strange bedfellows. It's Dianne Feinstein and Marco Rubio, again, Democrat-Republican nexus, looking for that money trough and the UFO threat through the CIA and Homeland Security. So um, this is one of the interesting factors that we're looking at when it comes to all these moves around new UFO uh, you know, the CIA phony disclosure and new UFO offices, that's how they build up the threat and then create money for it and, you know, be able to justify all that secrecy in 75 years of hiding it from the American public and doing God knows what to the people who revealed it. Uh, we've also talked about how in May during the UFO hearings, one of the things that they did rather shockingly was suggest and then come through with the idea uh, in the back and forth between the Illinois congressman and the Department of Defense official with the idea of punishing amateur interest groups for studying UFOs. I kid you not. Check the record. That came up in the UFO hearing in May. Okay, here we go again. Senate must back creation of Space National Guard to end a needless division. That's Diane Feinstein and Marco Rubio working cross party lines to try to get this UFO threat trough going. Uh, and this is some of what they say. We have proposed establishing a National Guard component for the Space Force. This is one of the most ridiculous things in the world. And the National Guard is there to basically back the states up, you know, if anything happens or to be there in the case of floods and, you know, all these types of things that take place. And the Guard could get called up, and, you know, in a World War situation, but it's pretty rare. And uh, in, in some rioting, you know, they call on the National Guard to straighten things out. But the idea of National Guard in space <laughs> doesn't make any sense because who's going to be rioting in space? Uh, so this is another attempt to weaponize space over somebody else's control and more glomming on for control over that UFO file. And uh, just say no, you know, tell these people you're exposed. We figured out what you mean by attaching this all to the National Defense Authorization Act. That's how you got the illegal powers after 9-11 to do all these things like warrantless wiretaps, surveillance of American citizens, uh, the TSA, and all these types of things. So um, when it comes to the UFO file, giving those same people the 9-11 powers is a terrible idea. And what they're doing is, is pretty smart. They've used it before, which is hold all of that almost trillion dollar uh, authorization act up if they don't assign these things because when you're in the senate intelligence committee you can do that you can lob things on there and basically nobody can move forward and approve anything the president can't sign it so everybody is a hostage uh, when they do that so uh rubio and feinstein say we have proposed establishing a national guard component for the space force to eliminate that needless division on June 22nd, the House Armed Services Committee voted to include the provision in its version of the National Defense Authorization Act. And here's what's weird. Forbes magazine, financial publication of which I'm very, really familiar with, uh, they were the ones who were driving this whole thing. And they were like, we need to get a Space National Guard. Why on earth do Wall Street people take an interest in having a Space National Guard? Uh, there's absolutely no reason for Space National Guard. We already uh, are in violation of a number of different treaties in space. And, you know, weaponizing space any further is a terrible idea. President Kennedy said when he established the space program that it was for scientific inquiry. We we're going to make sure it was de-weaponized. And we were working on that with the Russians back then. So we're going to revert now and start adding new types of military up there. It's a terrible idea. They've already been calling it a war fighting domain, which is beyond absurd because, of course, 
the only, I mean, you have enough war down here <laughs> and it's very easy for the nations to say, you know what, let's step on the brakes here and we don't want to have endless war in space too. So let's not weaponize space. Instead, there's all these financial contracts going up for it. And the idea is control of everything on the ground from the space grid, uh, not to mention the secret space program and beyond with the continuity of government program. Okay. Since I said continuity of government, you know, Admiral Van Herc was going to come up. <laughs> Van Herc is somebody we've pointed out on this program. Uh, it's General Van Herc now, actually, and he is the commander of NORTHCOM and NORAD and would the, uh, become the combatant commander of the United States in the event of uh, the activating of continuity of government. Now, see, this activation of COG is a lot closer than you realize because even with Biden, you know, being in his fudgely dudgely state, <laughs> Uh, we could really be looking at that activation. They almost, they try to pull this at the end of the Trump term when they weren't sure if they could get him out with the weird ballot stuff. And instead they were going to just with his COVID announcement in October, you know, remove him from office and install uh, the COG commander. Now this is a, a kind of a dangerous situation that we're in with this, but Van Herc who, as I've said before, is part of the 509th Bomb Group, which is the original Roswell group that found the Roswell wreckage there in New Mexico and was the only group authorized to drop atomic weapons in 1947. Um, General Glenn Van Herc, now this is a quote from the New York Times from Julian Barnes' article, and they're quoting Van Herc, of NORAD command. And he says, my job as the NORAD commander is to identify every single UAP. What I would report to you is I've yet to find one that had aliens or was the spaceship that we've identified. It's all weird language, but what he's saying is, well, there's a lot of UFOs, but I don't know if they're aliens yet. Uh, so the fact that we have the COG commander starting to bring the UFO thing into his purview of responsibilities is more of the setup of the UFO threat. Um, and you have a lot of people in that UFO field, as I've pointed out here, and it's very unfortunate to see them go down this road, uh, who are joining in and saying, or, you know, saying, oh, they're not trying to do a, a UFO threat thing, you know, like just leave them alone. They're good CIA, don't you know? Um, and so some of the, you know, people that were reliable on this subject, looking into it have now all thrown in with this weird CIA group was trying to take over the UFO file and generate this UFO threat. So the idea is they get these UFO uh, researchers to come out and say, no, there is no UFO threat uh, that they're promoting. And the media doesn't care about this. When every day they pound home a uh, UAP, there's a new UFO story. I read them off every week. There's tons of them. I'm aware of it because <laughs> I'm right in here. House votes to make it easier to report UFOs. These stories are here all the time. So um, the people who are, you know, feeding you that line, they're just, they're either out of touch or they're intentionally saying those things, which is very disturbing. And in any case, they're letting down um, a lot of people because many people come into the UFO thing and don't know anything about it at all. So the idea that these expert types, you know, and it's hard, you know, some of them are pseudo experts, but these expert types come out and sort of play this game of saying, oh no, it's good that the CIA is involved. They're a faction, you know, no, they're not. It's the Central Intelligence Agency. <laughs> uh, and they're, you know, they're not here to buy groceries. I mean, they're here to find some way to subvert your rights at home like they do abroad. That's the reality. Study the deep state uh, through figures like Peter Dale Scott or Jefferson Morley, and that's what you find out the history of the CIA is. Why would any reliable researcher want the CIA in on UFO disclosure. This is one of the sick things that's been bubbling up. And I feel like there's a reward system. You know, I'm loath to call it bribery, but it's more of a, um, you know, I'll let you in on the secret. You'll be in the big club kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, so I, but in all seriousness, I think it needs to be called out and people really uh, who are studying in this field. And I always call out the same names, Pope, Dolan, um, George Knapp, all those people, they need to set up, you know, which side of this that they're on, you know, are you on the CIA threat side who is promoting this false thing to get money through the NDAA 
Or are you going to call that stuff out and say the TTSA was a fraud? You're right. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, these are the, it's just on the record now. These guys have been around for four years. Every member around that whole team had some CIA connection. But in any case, the leaders of the TTSA who launched this phony wave of UFO disclosure in 2017 are all uh, CIA people. Jim Semivan, senior member of the Central Intelligence Agency, 25 years in the directorate. That's the top level, everybody. So, um, you know, these are the types of things that when you hear the people who've been in the field going like, oh, no, it's good that the establishment people are in this. You know, I, they've just lost their marbles. <laughs> they spent their entire career going against the government. And then these phony CIA people say that government needs to give us disclosure. And then they're like, yeah, the CIA is right. The CIA is the government. So it's a weird head game. And they've caught a lot of uh, those researchers up in it. And uh, that field is not looking very good. I actually recommend, you know, I'm really hoping that a lot of good people come into that field because the the lot that's there right now have all completely folded to this big push. And I think we need to get everybody on notice that, no, we see exactly what's going on with this. And we're not going to let the intelligence agencies come in and take over the UFO file. It's not going to happen. Everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist Show. We're going to go deep tonight through the figure of Albert Einstein and Charles Hapgood, also a scientist, incredible combination that they should meet there out in space and their subject was the pole shift in atlantis think about that also we're going to be taking your questions in the second half of the show and miss olivia before i dive in how are you doing okay. good uh karen carpenter wants to know does desantis running with trump have implications for space force or disclosure uh with desantis linked with space through bigelow <laughs> Well, I think that Trump or DeSantis's head would explode if they ran with each other. <laughs> you know, <laughs> think about it. Uh, they're both basically the same person. So uh, DeSantis is younger and has less baggage because of some things uh, that Trump did at the end of his administration. But um, at the same time, Trump, you know, had Pence, who was very much like a straight man type. And that's what you need when you're a dynamic guy who wants to get a lot, a lot of things done. And uh, right now, it's anybody's ball game. Uh, Trump could come out really and wow him. You know, he could come out in the, for the next two years and just blow this whole decrepit Stepford Biden machine away and expose the wokeism and all that stuff. Uh, so he has a perfectly clear track to do it and a, you know, a quarter of a billion dollars in political donations. So there's no slowing down the silver bullet there. The thing is that um, DeSantis has a really good record in Florida now. And he stood up under very difficult circumstances and he pushed a lot of these things through. And so the way I look at that is um, it's really anybody's game there between those two. What's going on on the Democratic side, I think, is actually very interesting when you think about this, because what we have is they're trying to create a scenario where Gavin Newsom can be the nominee or the replacement president. And uh, Newsom is one of the craziest uh, they have, the California governor who famously said that he could declare martial law if he wanted to, you know, no, you can't. <laughs> There's a little thing you swore on uh, to call the constitution. And uh, so you can't do that regardless of what people have told you, but with you, him, you will get secession. Yes. If that happens. Yeah. Oh, I definitely agree. Um, and who knows that may be exactly the thing they want. I can appreciate that on their side of the Democrats, they figure, oh, we've got to put somebody young out after we've put this, like, um, you know, dementia patient out there. And, you know, there's a lot of people who are uh, Biden's age who are incredibly dynamic and could handle the job. But this guy, there's no way. And, um, you know, they knew that. They put him in there just because they wanted the establishment takeover. And they got it. But unfortunately, uh, what they got with it were more wars, this time direct war with Russia through a proxy. It's a terrible idea. Every president has avoided that very carefully because it's a nuclear nation. And we have a lot in common uh, with the Russian people and a lot of exchange to go on there. I want to report something that's pretty good, though. It's a new development is they've decided 
between Russia and the Ukraine not to impact f- the food exchanges and food traveling between the two countries. That's very important. Um, so even with all the craziness, they both recognize, well, we don't all want to starve to death. <laughs> and I agree with that in that part of the world, essentially. Absolutely. Jay Vandervest is mentioning that Ron Paul, of course, is older than Biden and vital as can be. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Ron Paul could have been a really incredible uh, president. Rand Paul, you may see uh, run in 2024 and would make a very convincing VP spot as well, if not a very convincing case for himself as president. But when you see the kind of money uh, behind Trump, they're trying to get Trump with the January 6th committee stuff, but it's some of the worst. (laughs) I mean, it's horrible, the takedown that they're doing on that, but it's a waste of the taxpayers' money. Everybody knows it's it's just a a show trial, basically. It's like the old kangaroo court show trials that they did in Nazi Germany. Um, But nonetheless, uh, Trump would have his own, you know, he's got all that momentum. It looks like a pretty clear field for him. In terms of the general election, they, there's a lot of light on DeSantis because it is possible that he would fare as well or better than Trump in a general election because he's had a very solid record. Really hard to say right now, uh, but they might strike some kind of a backroom deal. But I don't think you're going to see this guy on the VP ticket. You got something else? I did want to ask this. Thank you. Says it's a space race between the Pentagon and the CIA who will ultimately get in control of the UFO file. Is there a competition there? Yeah. um, Well, the whole thing, if you really go back in the history, this is crucial, and this is what gets missed a lot. Um, In about 1958, with the announcement of NASA, the groups that were working uh, to reinvestigate and reanimate that UFO wreckage and things of that nature, they they got very scared, and they wanted it to be under the military. And... Um, it's very interesting because Eisenhower fought for it to be a non DOD because he wanted the open space thing, just like Kennedy open space. And what happened is they used a number of leverages so that by the end of his administration, uh, Eisenhower was saying to people, I've lost control. That thing is gone. So somewhere along the line through this deal of turning it over to private interests, private corporations, the aerospace industry got the upper hand, but the intelligence agencies were still the liaison for the whole thing. They held the files. They could still burn everybody. So the, um, you'll find this in the X-Protect documentary that I did, that, and there's a link to that in the description of this video, that fundamentally what happened was um, the intelligence agencies and the aerospace companies decided to divvy up. Um, that control, and they try to keep the president progressively out of the loop. There's famous stories about um, Eisenhower threatening them, you know, that he was going to send the Eighth Army in there down to Area 51 to get that information back. So uh, when Kennedy gets in, he tries more cleverly, in a sense, to get the UFO file back. And he's saying to the CIA, submit to me all the cases. I want to share them with the Russians so that we don't have a nuclear exchange over an UFO. And um, famously, Douglas Caddy, the Watergate lawyer, told me on this program that uh, his best friend, E. Howard Hunt, told him, well, Kennedy was assassinated over the UFO file, basically over that decision to share it. Now, um, that's what we've been in that default position there since the assassination in 1963. And believe it or not, JFK comes up tonight in this um, whole rigmarole with Einstein and our good friend Hapgood. And it's kind of fascinating the way that these presidents and that era is so crucial. It set the tone for the next 60 years dramatically. And we're still fighting that battle, including the fact that, um, you know, the UFO file is still secret. It's still the major piece that's being fought over. And it's been fought behind uh, you know, doors behind closed doors for so many years. And now that fight is becoming public. And so you're seeing a new UFO office announced every week. Hey, I'm the CIA. I have UFO threat power. Hey, I'm the space force. The executive branch has it back. Uh, hey, there's, we need a space national guard. Hey, we need AIMSOG. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. So this is the nature of that battle and the screwball TTSA um, CIA piece. That was part of that as well. So, It's a really dynamic situation, but uh, I think the thing that we can do on the citizen side in looking at it is direct 
them, when they talk about attaching the UFO defense stuff to the NDAA, that's a huge red flag. So that's one where we can really, uh, you know, go back and say, no, don't attach any of that stuff and actually keep UFOs as a scientific inquiry. How about that? No military involved at all. Well, then all the people that they've rolled out there like Elizondo and all that would go through the roof because then their job is, is done pretty much. You'd have to be janitor at Space Command. <laughs> That's the thing. Could we address one thing before we move off of UFOs? Yes. Okay. So David Frank says, looks like they're getting everything they want without the UFO threat through COVID and food depletion. Could you address this? It's not true. I mean, you know, I, I heard, I think Dolan was pushing that. Like they don't need a UFO threat. That's completely wrong. I, <laughs> you know, I don't know what informs these people. Look, when you have something that you can use as a global threat for emergency powers, that's your best card. That's the best thing you have going. So if you've used a medical emergency for that, you're going to get a certain amount of mileage. If you used a digital ID takeover, you'll get a certain amount of mileage, but you might need the full uh, gambit. They don't take any of those options off the table. And the idea that like, oh, well, they don't need that UFO threat. Come on. You know, <laughs> it's ridiculous. How much information do we have over 75 years that they've put this uh, in action behind the scenes. They have a, a whole plan for the UFO takeover op. Don't think that they did. Think about Operation Northwoods. Operation Northwoods was a plan submitted to President Kennedy in 1962. And the idea was to remotely control a plane and have it shot down and blame it on the Cubans. Okay, basically it sounds very much like a 9-11 scenario. Kennedy rejected it back then. That's the way that these people think. You know, th these are the plans that they have behind the scenes. So don't tell me that they wouldn't pull a UFO threat. It's ridiculous. Werner von Braun's warning to Carol Rosen. Um, it's not something that you can blow off if four out of the five things he said was going to happen have happened already. <laughs> and the last one is the alien threat card, right? Uh, so no, there's no... The idea that like, oh, they already have enough, you know, and they don't need that UFO threat thing. So just forget about that. And like Elizondo and all those guys are good. No, we've already laid out over four years why that thing was created. It's very simple. If you go through it, the Central Intelligence Agency was behind it. They created all of their members, created the To The Stars Academy group. And um, then they sent out this guy and pretended that he ran a program that didn't exist. ATIP, which was later admitted to be an activity, not a program. So, um, you know, we, we need to kind of deprogram ourselves a little bit from what they are doing. And this is where both the media, in some cases, because they don't know any better, but certainly at higher levels on purpose. Um, and, but the UFO people bending over for this stuff and, you know, kissing up to CIA people it doesn't make any sense. They built their careers for decades on challenging the government for cover up. So you can't say that, you know, well, the CIA people are good. Um, so there's, there's a real disconnect there. It needs to be a discussion, but I have a feeling now when I watch the people in those fields, they don't want to actually have a discussion about it. What they want to do is try to portray the other side of the people who don't agree with them somehow subversive <laughs> And uh, that's going nowhere. I mean, I can tell you. So I think a lot of those people, you know, their, their careers are, are going to tank because they've based themselves in a way as a truth teller. And when you are in the business of telling the truth and you aren't telling the truth, you get out of the business. That's the way uh, it goes. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. We're going deep tonight on the UFO file uh, here in the open. But now we're going to move everything over to Einstein and Babbitt. Um, Elwood Babbitt and also our friend Charles Hapgood. We're going to be taking your questions in part two of the program. This is X Series 129, and uh, we're going to be with you here for a couple hours. Before we go any further, Miss Olivia, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, I did want to say one last thing about that, which I absolutely agree with. Um, Chris Lothian says it's their ace card. Why play it un until absolutely <laughs> necessary? Right? Yeah. You, you leave it. What are, you, what are you going to play after that? It's right? one of the most absurd things. I, when UFO researchers peddle that, it's, it sounds to me like somebody is telling them to say that because they must know better. Well, it's a problem. <laughs> it's certainly a problem with logic. 
right? Yeah. It seems very obvious. They need to go back to UFO school. <laughs> <laughs> Number one rule, cover up. Number two, the government does the cover up. Okay. Um, all right. So let's move now into the hot zone. Are you ready? I want you to take all that time and attention that you've spent out there looking at all these news stories developing and focus it down into an interesting area that lies between Florida, Bimini, Cuba, and the Yucatan Peninsula. And we're going to go down there tonight because we're going to find that there were things that were taking place there in the hot zone and that's actually run a good deal of our geopolitical foreign policy uh, over the course of almost a hundred years now, and that there's a large scale secret associated with advanced technology and ancient cultures that's going on down there. And, um, you know, so we really, we're going to take this in through the figure of Charles Hapgood and his association with Albert Einstein, of course, the top theoretical physicist. And when we go into uh, Einstein, it's very interesting because he was kind of neck and neck with a certain type of theoretical physics and other things, other streams were rejected by the corporate world and the controlling powers such as Tesla, uh, who had a great objection to um, many of Einstein's theories, although he felt that Einstein was coming from a good place. But Einstein um, basically got to be, you know, the one who established the new science around theoretical physics. And um, what's interesting to watch is when Hitler comes to power, Einstein flees here, but then he goes to Caltech and he spends a great deal of time there um, with the leadership at Caltech. And there's all this stuff associated around the Sun King. And I'll leave that. I did that in an episode, um, but it's very interesting. His time in Pasadena, you don't want to miss that. Um, but we did an episode now, I think it was X-Series 44. So it's going back a couple of years, which involved um, the kind of ruminations of a pole shift that Edgar Casey had that Charles Hapgood, a uh, scientist, had followed up on and decided, you know, this, there might be a lot to this. There's a few things about Hapgood I think we should get on the table right away. Of course, he made incredible inroads, um, getting people to acknowledge the idea that pole shift could be caused by this uh, global crustal displacement theory that he had. And he got some very unusual backing. <laughs> the unusual backing was through the figure of Albert Einstein. Um, and I'm going to read... Uh, a couple of things here. There's a book called Atlantis, the Fate of the Lost Continent. And it has a little section here on the bio of Hapgood with a couple of good juicy details. But anyway, um, so it's May 8th, 1953. An elderly professor with a fondness for the violin sits down at his desk in Princeton, New Jersey, and writes a letter to Charles Hapgood, an obscure instructor at a small New England college. The professor was Albert Einstein, and the topic of the letter was a theory of Hapgood's that had electrified the great physicist. Remember that. He's now electrifying Einstein. That can't be easy, and it probably didn't happen that often. Quote, Einstein wrote, I found your arguments very impressive and have the impression that your hypothesis is correct. One can hardly doubt that significant shifts in the crust of the earth have taken place repeatedly and within a short time. Charles Hutchins Hapgood, 1904 to 1982, a graduate of Harvard College and the Harvard Graduate School, right behind us here, of arts and scientists, was born in New York City. After graduating, Hapgood traveled to Germany, where his studies at the University of Freiburg coincided with Hitler's rise to power. When World War II erupted, he returned to the United States and joined the Office of Strategic Studies, OSS, the forerunner of the Central Intelligence Agency, um, you know, there's a great deal of tie over with uh, JFK's work with naval intelligence and also Ernest Hemingway's work around the OSS. And all of these people are going to be linked when we come into this deeper hot zone mystery relating directly um, to these ancient ruins and the large scale finds that have taken place, but also ancient 
weaponry and ancient technology and the suggestion of things uh, don't quite act the way that they should nature-wise when you get into certain aspects and areas of the hot zone, the Bermuda Triangle, I guess, is the most obvious. And the idea that compasses spin and there's a whole magnetic anomalies, et cetera. Uh, well, they've discovered a certain type of technology and technological action that takes place in that area. And that's part of what all this fun is about. Let's go a little bit further. Um, so he was at Keene State College in New Hampshire, and he was formulating a theory of Earth crust displacement. Einstein's correspondence with Hapgood began in November 52 and lasted until Einstein's death in April 1955, Einstein wrote at least 10 letters to Hapgood and conducted scientific correspondence with other interested parties about Hapgood's theory, and then would do the foreword for his incredible uh, book on the pole shift. So um, that's putting yourself out there a lot. And uh, interestingly enough, um, Einstein died in 55 and a lot of the attention and a lot of the support for Hapgood kind of went out the window with him, unfortunately. But he discovered a great deal. I'm going to show you exactly what that was. What do you got there? Uh, Oakham 5 says, I don't know if Daniel will make reference to it, but among other things, Hapgood was an adjunct professor at UMass Amherst. He was. And uh, he spent all this time right here in Cambridge, which is where he would meet Elwood Babbitt, who was um, basically like, the Massachusetts Edgar Casey. Uh, he would go into trance state and give these deep readings. I don't think any, you know, it's very hard for any psychic to compete with the amount of detail and things that came through Edgar Casey. Let's face it, um, you know, but uh, Babbitt was certainly compelling, and his association with um, Hapgood would prove very fruitful because they would talk about uh, spiritual topics, but also earth changes and things of this nature. And both of them were very familiar with the Association for Research and Enlightenment. And, um, you know, there's correspondence that goes back and forth uh, with Hapgood and Hewlin Casey. But um, apparently, you know, sometimes it's suggested once in a while that Hewlin Casey wasn't the easiest person to get along with. And so both Babbitt and um, our friend Hapgood didn't have much association with the ARE after Casey's death. Um, but it is compelling when we think about how all this comes together. And here's the timeline. I'm going to sort of lay out a real skeleton nutshell version of how this works. In 1930, you've got Thomas Townsend Brown, and he goes to um, Cuba doing these secret experiments of deep submersion. And his follow-up career to that will be loaded with all of these black projects, including what looks to be uh, something along the lines of time travel technology and um, electrogravitics and things of this nature. Very, very deep secret projects. But it all starts when he goes to Cuba, and as soon as he gets there, there's a massive earthquake. Now, Thomas Townsend Brown, we've covered in other programs, but What's interesting is when we get into any time that Einstein spends himself in the hot zone, he's in Florida a lot, but I wanted to find him right in the center of things. And after doing some digging, in fact, I did. <laughs> no great surprise. He was down there and there are newspaper reports in 1930, uh, 1930, uh, where he is doing these visiting uh, going on down there in Cuba. And what's happening was quite fascinating. He's down there, and while he's down there, Hubble, who will create the Hubble telescope for Caltech, those guys get together. So it's an astronomy visit, which is also kind of strange. And also it's unplanned, so it's a surprise visit. Uh, and that could have been for assassination prevention purposes because when Einstein went to America and stayed in Pasadena, the first thing that happened to him when he was at Caltech was a car tried to run him over. And he, you know, the description is that he did a somersault to get out of the way. <laughs> now, under ordinary circumstances, you could say, oh, it was just a car accident, whatever the people took off. But when you are the top scientist in the world, it's, you know, fundamentally, you assume it's an assassination attempt. All right. Um, this is the visit that he makes there. And he meets the top uh, people there. He's got the Secretary of State in Cuba. 
And the visit itself is unusual, and he spends most of his time with the Secretary of State and with Hubble. And so the nature of him being there and the nature of that mission has been shrouded in secrecy. But he spends a good deal of time there. And um, what ends up happening is he starts to form this tight bond when he's in America with someone uh, who will become the person who uh, is the executor of his will when he dies. And this person, he forwards the correspondence, Dr. Otto Nathan, between himself and Charles Hapgood. Now, here's what's interesting when you are familiar with the Hot Zone episodes that we've done. If you know of a little episode that we have that's called the kernel in the hot zone. <laughs> this is one of uh, the real hardcore important episodes in the whole hot zone series because it ties in uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. And uh, there's a whole huge corporate conglomerate piece associated with the hot zone. But what happened there is that uh, the colonel's daughter, Margaret Sanders, came forward and led the looking for Casey's ruins of Bimini. And she had been a member of the ARE and she had grown up in Kentucky. And my guess is that because Casey had grown up in Kentucky, that's how she discovered him. But she got totally fascinated and wanted to find the ruins of Atlantis and Bimini and actually moved to Bimini and worked there. Um, what would happen later is that her son was part of the original group finding the Bimini road, although it was, and that's Trig Adams, who I've spoken to and who we may yet get uh, on the program. We're in talks uh, with him, but you know, he, he's there and then he disappears on his boat <laughs> in the hot zone. Um, what's interesting about him uh, is that he was pretty young when all this happened, but his mother had a group called MARS and they were the ones uh, that Valentine was associated with. And Valentine, J. Manson Valentine was a Yale oceanographer who was aware um, that, you know, of this Casey prediction and went over the ruins and found the wall. So um, the fundamental prediction on Casey's side, the sleeping prophet Edgar Casey, was that right off the coast of Bimini was a temple of Poseidia, which was like the last outpost of the Atlantis uh, great continent and that it was incredibly advanced and that it was rising, that the land was rising. It was going to become visible. And so he said, expected in 68 or 69, not so far away. And he makes that prediction in 1943. Well, um, Manson Valentine finds it right after uh, Trig Adams and his mother have found uh, all these links to it. They're just about to announce their discovery. But Manson Valentine gets to it first, and then he decides, oh, I'm not part of Mars anymore. I'm doing my own thing. As I'd like to point out about Manson Valentine, a lot of his work went black afterwards, including the fact that he was looking for pyramids in um, South Florida. Now, uh, and by all accounts, it looks like from based on some letters that are left in a museum that he found them. But what happened, and I, what I think is crucial about him, is that he was best friends with Morris K. Jessup. And Jessup, on the UFO file front, the Philadelphia experiment, all of those things, was kind of like the real educated statesman. And he's the guy who comes in and he's giving UFOs a very legitimate path. And this is 56 and 57. So in 1958, he's found um, in a park and you know he's run the carbon monoxide into his car and committed suicide after you know, no depression, nothing. But the person he was going to see was his best friend, Manson Valentine. Well, 10 years later, Manson Valentine shows up and he is discovering the Bimini Wall off the coast of Bimini, right there in the hot zone. Now, um, I'm going to do a little walk down memory lane here for a moment because the hot zone and how we get into that is we've presented on this program since 2018 uh, evidence that that area by certain um, groups that are mapping the ocean floor or studying minerals or are members of the military uh, are under an NDAA and under court martial that they cannot reveal what they find uh, if they go into that area of the hot zone. So if they see like the temple of ISIS down there, uh, 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 you can't mention anything to the press or you're going to jail. So um, 
this is this was a weird thing to discover in my own research, but the hot zone and that they had a name for it and that everyone seemed to have some name that was associated with hot zone. So that when I went to regular kind of well-known Atlantis researchers and people of this ilk, and I said things to them like, have you ever heard of the hot zone? You know, and they would say like, well, I've heard of this, you know, like, so it was all this similar stuff. So obviously for people who are in the know, uh, the hot zone is something that they have to deal with on a regular basis. So the hot zone, fundamentally, that area um, off the western tip of Cuba, all the way over to Bimini, and then the Yucatan Peninsula, that area has been a hotbed of geopolitical infighting, uh, everything from the Cuban Missile Crisis to the Venezuela um, issue where Cuba and Venezuela were against the United States. And um, so when we look at these issues, we see that there was something more going on than just political tensions. You know, uh, why did the Russians really risk everything to get in there, to get into Cuba? So there's, there's a bigger backstory. And certainly President Kennedy's involvement with Cuba is also bigger uh, and gets into the fact that the Kennedy Library is now the number one holder of any Ernest Hemingway document. They hold 95% of every material related to Ernest Hemingway's writings. That's pretty remarkable. Basically what we're talking about is somebody who controls the entire estate. And so when you go to the Kennedy Library, what you're dealing with is the Ernest Hemingway legacy. And on that note, yes. Kate Schneider's asking, I hope DJ brings up the Einstein Hemingway ET connection tonight. <laughs> Excellent, yes. That one is coming up and it is a doozy. I do have it here. Um, and it's fascinating because we're going to find over and over again, these people are linked together and it doesn't make sense on the surface. Even if you say to a typical historian, oh yeah, by the way, at the Kennedy library is all the Hemingway stuff. It's sort of like, huh? Show me something else that's like that. You know, does Obama's library hold all the, <laughs> you know, um, writings of some famous author. I mean, it does, it's very strange. So, um, but there's a very, very deep reason for it. And we're getting into that tonight. Everyone you're watching the X series 129. We're going deep here on this hot Cambridge night, trying to bring you a real depth perception of the hot zone. And if you're down there in the hot zone, you're going to feel really close to all the goings on because we're going to get very into Bimini, Cuba and Yucatan tonight, uh, including the fact that, and uh, there's a way to say this. I think you've done this for me before. It's Acambaro or Acambaro. It's in Mexico. It's A-C-A-M-B-O-R-O. -O. It would be Acam uh, Acambaro. Acambaro. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> this is very interesting. And, I can tell you that um, it has a lot to do with anomalies down there because what was found, and this, this was discovered as part of um, Charles Hapgood's discoveries, a massive treasure trove of Mayan relics of the Mayans playing, and I, I kid you not, playing with dinosaurs. <laughs> uh, there's a big piece here that we get into that's coming up. Stay tuned because the Akambaro is, is going to be very, very uh, mind blowing. I can tell you that. But I'm not going to get there yet because I want to finish off what I was saying about the Colonel. So, Margaret Adams, Margaret Sanders are the same person. And it was actually hard to find Margaret Sanders. And if you don't search for Margaret Adams, you get basically very thin results. And if you search for Margaret Adams, there's not much, but it's that key. It was the doorway for me to find it. And she wrote a very fascinating book where she includes all this called The Colonel's Secret. Now, The Colonel's Secret is about his secret recipe. But um, in there, she talks all about her relationship with, ready, Albert Einstein. So we have Albert Einstein now who approaches her and through this person called Dr. Otto Nathan, who is the executor of Einstein's estate and also is, handles the correspondence between our friend Hapgood and Einstein. Now, Otto Nathan um, comes out of Germany. He also is fleeing the horror of the Nazi regime rise. And he comes over here and he's basically at Princeton and is an economics professor. 
but somehow he has some kind of lock tie-in with Albert Einstein. And Einstein uh, becomes friends with our friend, Margaret Sanders, the Colonel's daughter, through this. Now, what, here's how it happens. She goes to Washington, D.C., and she's watching something at the National Archives. And she, the next day at her hotel, this man approaches her, who turns out to be Otto Nathan, and he says, I saw you at the National Archives yesterday. And she says, oh, and he says, so who are you? And they get to know each other. And he says, well, I'm best friends with Albert Einstein. And she says, well, I'm the daughter of Colonel Sanders. And I have written all this stuff I wanted to give to Albert Einstein. And he says, well, that's great. I'm going to take your letters with me and, you know, we'll do this whole thing. It's a very odd setup the way it's described. It's almost like, you know, something out of a movie. Does this really make any sense that this woman bumps into the top person uh, connected with Einstein when she was just hanging around Washington? And it turned out that she had her own theory of relativity and wanted to compare notes and also tell them about her Atlantis findings, et cetera. And finally, it gets around to the idea that since she's a great sculptress, that she's going to sculpt a bust of Einstein. Well, uh, they have this wonderful correspondence and the family kept the letters, et cetera. And this is part of the piece that's well known there. Now, here is Margaret Adams with Dr. Nathan. And um, that is directly out of her book. It's, you actually can't find it on the internet. So that one's special. And um, we have the picture there of Nathan talking with Einstein and then her talking with Nathan. And um, so now, why is that important? Einstein is getting on board with the pole shift concept that Charles Hapgood is bringing forward, which is very radical in its time. And remember, he's the top man. Uh, nobody really compares to him, except, you know, Oppenheimer did for a while before they destroyed his reputation. So um, for the top scientists to now be involved in the pole shift argument and Hapgood to be talking about Atlantis and getting into Casey's readings and all this kind of stuff, this is pretty interesting. But now they approach the colonel's daughter through Dr. Nathan. Well, now her, the things that she would do later, like going on this mad dash trying to find Casey's Bimini before it rose, makes a little more sense because it seems like that group is operating again. And what will happen later is that Marvin Minsky will become uh, Margaret Adams' great friend. And Marvin Minsky is one of the top uh, AI transhumanist guys over at MIT. Now, interestingly enough, when we look at Marvin Minsky, um, another Atlantis piece falls into place because as we revealed in the Ghislaine in the Hot Zone episode, um, the Epstein-Maxwell people targeted Marvin Minsky and tried to get him involved in the sex blackmail thing. Uh, and they wanted to basically extort ideas from him. That's the way I read that. And we get that story um, through what happened with uh, Virginia Giuffre and her open testimony hit. And she said, you know, what's interesting is they were using the granddaughter of Jacques Cousteau. <laughs> now, whenever you get around these people, uh, Maxwell, um, you know, Einstein, all this, there's always this ocean component. And um, it's either for good or for evil or whatever. But with Maxwell, it was Terramar. It's like, let's save the ocean and we'll make you a citizen of Terramar. You'll be a citizen of the ocean kingdom and all these things. I've talked a lot about how um, different people who were celebrities were involved in purchasing lots in the Atlantic Ocean. It's like everyone was aware something was rising and they wanted to be there when it happened. The most famous case of this is Ernest Hemingway's brother. Um, and as we demonstrated in the Hot Zone shows, he set up the kingdom of New Atlantis. It was an independent nation. He had his own stamps. He sent a, a letter to LBJ and all the rest of it. Um, so we have this weird signature of something rising there in the hot zone. And then we have further back the Casey readings informing some of Hapgood's discoveries. And now we have Einstein associated with Margaret Sanders. So what we're getting is a very, very high level of scientific achievement and ability being mixed with a great interest or a great connection with this idea of Atlantis. And then uh, if we go a little further, you're going to find that there's an intelligence piece because even our friend Hapgood was involved with the OSS 
And um, we're going to find that a lot of the really top Atlantean researchers, some of them are straight out of British intelligence, and they thought, you know, the best way to deal with this thing is in retirement. Let's get it out. And Egerton Sykes, who is um, one of the most important, and I've pointed out in this program, and he, he died in the 80s, but his work is completely uh, left out there and nobody knows what to make of it. But he had the most extensive knowledge of what was going on there. And he said, look, there are temples, ISIS temples, pyramids, the whole bit. There's a whole thoroughfare of ruins underneath uh, in the hot zone, under the water. And um, so one of the things that we followed up on here very deeply in was the 2001 discovery of Paulina Zelitsky in the Cuban city off the western tip of Cuba. So now with all that in mind, let's re-engage here with our friend Charles Hapgood and the strange occurrence of him uh, becoming so close to and endorsing our friend uh, Hapgood. All right, quick thing, a quick aside. Colonel Sanders' daughter had buried career. There she is. And I'll just read a little bit of this so um, we get part of the official version of what they have to say here. Uh, Miss Sanders once wrote to Einstein telling him about her theory of relativity and what she thought about this. Uh, he wrote back, her daughter kept the correspondence. Mother had one of those far out minds that understood that stuff, she said. Miss Sanders also had a big interest in the lost continent of Atlantis and flew to Bimini in search of it. Now it becomes part of the record of who she is. And it's all in that book, which I highly recommend, uh, which is called The Colonel's Secret. 11 Herbs and a Spicy Daughter. <laughs> That's the name of it. Um, You're making everybody hungry in the ideas room. <laughs> the Colonel has that effect. Uh, but it's interesting because he got very upset at uh, what took place, in fact, uh, after he sold off the franchises. He felt the food quality went down the drain, but that's, that's for another time. Okay. In the middle of all this, right smack dab in the middle of this, just before Einstein passes away, there's a huge discovery in Acambaro, Mexico. And it is these Mayans and other unusual figures, which I believe this is a huge Atlantean treasure trove discovery. And um, what happens is the discovery leads to a lot of panic in archeological circles because what's happening is they're losing control of the old narrative that there's no Atlantis and all the rest of it. And the Casey story now is starting to show up something that they're studying and Casey's story is the Atlanteans were more advanced, they had advanced technology, um, and that they could control things with their minds and that they could build pyramids with sound and all the rest of it. Now, this is the story that's informing Hapgood's uh, scientific research. So he's, he's kind of dangerous at this point to these people. So let's read a little bit about what they discovered there at this unusual thing. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. This is X-Series 129. We're going deep, deep into the hot zone uh, tonight, and it's perfect because I think it's about 95 degrees, isn't it? <laughs> Somewhere in there. Uh, okay. Did dinosaurs coexist with humans? Mystery at Acambaro, Mexico. Uh, beginning in 1950, stories of a large collection of strange ancient figurines surfaced in the American and Mexican press. A Valdemar Isrod... Uh, or Jules Rod, a German shopkeeper living in Acambaro, had purchased from local excavators more than 33,000 clay figurines made by previously unknown cultures. Now, what happens is a very strange series of events, which is that uh, our friend gets hired, our friend Hapgood gets hired to go there and investigate. And when he gets there, he finds in a house, uh, he's, he's done some figuring out of the way that the tunnels were uh, laid out and how the discoveries were made. And then he goes to a house and he figures underneath the house, there should be more of these figurines if these lines are correct. So he's following ancient lines and he finds a huge treasure trove of these very unusual uh, humans playing with dinosaurs. And also the groups um, 
of figurines, et cetera, are pretty unusual looking. <laughs> they don't look like typical Mayan art by a long shot. Um, but this one is a shot that is our friend Hapgood in the background there um, with a couple of museum curators trying to figure out what these things are and getting them into that museum. And then there is a shot of our friend Charles Hapgood, who will come forward with the pole shift theory. But here he is in the middle of all this, getting called away and hired to investigate what was going on. His claim, after doing nine months of research and using top experts, et cetera, was the following, that the objects came from 3000 BC or older, and that they were totally of a different culture that lived down there side by side previous to the Mayans. So that's where basically he left it. There was a huge outcry that it was a hoax and that um, there's no way this could have been a culture that they missed and all the rest. Here's more of these very unusual figurines at Acambaro. Um, and so we're getting into weird territory because as I said, many of the shots show human beings playing with these dinosaurs. <laughs> and here is our friend uh, Hapgood down there caught in the middle of this controversy. And while he's down there, uh, Peter Herkos shows up. Peter Herkos would be a very famous psychic who came to prominence more in the 60s, but he is around and his story becomes famous in the 50s. And he's down there. And um, then we have some of the people who, uh, like Puharich, Andre Puharich, who set up the Nine Group, et cetera, who eventually promote Yuri Geller. He's down there. And uh, what they is kind of figured out over time is that they were down there testing um, the mushrooms for their psychedelic abilities. But it's very strange that we have these kind of CIA people down there already, you know, messing around with these ruins that we find in Mexico. So this becomes more of a rolling scandal. And what they do is they shut down everything around the find and the figurines still hang out there in history. And Traditional archaeology doesn't have any place for it because it's so controversial. But Hapgood, who did the research, said, hey, we did the testing on it, and you know, we found that these things were 3,000 BC or older, and that puts them in the post-Atlantis uh, post -Atlantis phase, which brings us into these are fleeing. People are fleeing the hot zone destruction and going into Mexico through the Yucatan uh, entry and then heading up towards central Mexico. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show, X Series 129 here with Einstein and our friend Charles Hapgood, who posited in the 1950s that a pole shift may have happened and may be coming again. And guess what? Albert Einstein backed this obscure figure for some interesting uh, unknown reason. We're going to be taking your questions uh, the second half of tonight's program. I want to remind you to go to darkjournalist.com and sign up for the newsletter that keeps us in touch with each other. And really, uh, it's the only way we can kind of overcome this intense censorship uh, that we've been seeing. And it's the, really the best way because, you know, many of the networks are here today, gone tomorrow. I'm going to use them just as long as they're out there. But nonetheless, um, we're not, <laughs> you know, in terms of relying on it, I'd far prefer to have that one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, that's a free newsletter and there's not a whole lot of marketing in it. But you, what you will find and what I think is very valuable is uh, it's going to let you know about the shows that are coming up and the remarkable interviews and X-Series episodes that we have coming up for you uh, this summer and into the fall with some fascinating events and documentaries coming as well. Uh, if you want to support the show, you can become an active subscriber. And we really appreciate uh, all of our supporters who let us bring this material to you. All right, Miss Olivia. David Tormina. DJ, didn't Herkos claim his psychic abilities came to him as a result of a head trauma injury? Yes, Herkos is very fascinating. Um, there's a really weird story <laughs> about Herkos which I have to tell you is, is weird. Every time things get around Hercos, it's weird. So I'm going to give you my weird Hercos story. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right. When I was very young, 
Uh, my mother had a Peter Herkos book borrowed from the library, and I remember reading it. And I remember a little notation that she made on the book. And um, many years later, I was in a library looking around for a particular book, and I ran across this exact same book, but it was like 20 years later. <laughs> so that book had just floated around in the library. And I was like, oh, there it is again. I remember that from when I was seven years old. Uh, so the Herco stuff is a way of doing that. Here's what I can tell you about Herkos. Uh, he was a painter and he fell, I think, 30 feet off a ladder and he had incredible head trauma. And when he woke up, he saw all these lines interpenetrating between people like energy auric lines. And over time that faded out, but he had this ability to connect those lines between people and he would pick up on their thoughts. So he was used um, to find, you know, the Boston Strangler, and uh, he was used in all these really big, high-profile crime cases. And Howard Hughes used him as his personal psychic. I did not know that. Yeah, and when he went in, he had to um, get his readings behind the screen, and then when he left, Howard Hughes would like throw a check out the window. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, if that was even Hughes back there, if you didn't see him, who even knows? But uh, there's a weird, a very weird kind of trajectory of Herkos. But what happened early on is that Puharic, who becomes a very important figure, Andre Puharic, who created uh, the Nine and, and all these different psychic groups, which come into play again with this tonight. Believe it or not, this is what fascinates me so much about the hot zone work is the crisscross of influences is undeniable. And I feel like, you know, it's like that discovery. I mentioned this about ex steganography which is where we got the name for the series. But, you know, I feel like we have the Rosetta Stone and we've just uncovered that piece that opens up all the hieroglyphs. Um, and that's that's really what's happening with the hot zone research. There's so many fascinating areas to get into. And, you know, people focus a lot on Antarctica, which comes up a lot in Hapgood's research. I could have done the whole show on Antarctica because of the theories that Hapgood had in relation to it that Einstein agreed with. Um, and you want to just touch on that for a minute? Well, it's going to, it's, it'll be, it'll be another episode, but certainly it's related the whole lost continent thing. Uh, you know, it, there's more than one <laughs> and that they were sure through the Pirarese map. Actually, the Pirarese map is going to come up here. So I'll just get into it that way. Um, but did you have anything else? Uh, PB wanted to know, ask DJ if they found human re remains and dated them alongside the figurines. It's a good question. There's a whole book um, that Hapgood put out about uh, Hambaro. So I highly recommend it. And, um, it basically has all of the detailed research that he was able to do basically over the course of a year. And, um, you know, he was there in the field and interestingly enough, the person who funded him to go there was the person who wrote Perry Mason. <laughs> and this guy becomes very interesting as well because he's always doing archeological digs in Baja in Mexico and coming up with really extraordinary stuff. So this guy is one to watch in this whole story. And he shows up, there are all these pictures of him, you know, walking around the ruins with um, Hapgood. So a lot of weird characters right smack dab in the middle of this. Uh, this is the thing that Kate mentioned. Can you spot the human legend behind E.T.'s iconic alien eyes? All right, this is a New York Post story, and it's showing us this sort of quaint shot of our friend Einstein with E.T. And this is interesting. Just watch how these kind of forces all swing together. The unexpected inspirations proved effective. Um, let's see here. So there's a makeup artist who had worked with Spielberg on Aliens and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He won an Academy Award for his work on E.T., and it was his third Oscar, following wins for his work in Ridley Scott's Alien. But E.T. was the Italy native's crowning creation. Upon Rimbaldi's death in 2012 at age 86, Spielberg called him E.T.'s Geppetto. 
Uh, this month marks the 40th anniversary of Spielberg's childhood classic. The film ran in theaters for an unprecedented uh, full year until June of 1983. Um, so what happens here is they're trying to figure out how to do the eyes of <laughs> E.T. And Spielberg is telling uh, Carlo, the makeup guy, he says, I want it to be a little bit Albert Einstein and a little bit Ernest Hemingway and a little bit Carl Sandburg. Now think about E.T. Think about Hemingway and then Einstein. <laughs> Sandburg is one that we'll have to kind of figure out on a larger basis. He's a cultural force, but the combination of Albert Einstein and Hemingway being the inspiration for the eyes of E.T. Um, it lets us know that we're in the right ballpark. And uh, <laughs> this is a remarkable story. Uh, I feel like when we see that whole iconic piece, that he, there's some communication because Spielberg knows a great deal about the UFO file. So if he's making the ET's eyes Hemingway's, a mix of Hemingway's and Einstein's, there is a reason for it. Uh, and that is a fascinating piece. Okay. President Eisenhower. How does President Eisenhower get involved with this whole thing that uh, is involved with the pole shift and Hapgood and Einstein? Well, coming up on July 29th, okay, we're looking at the 64th anniversary of NASA. And the Space Agency bill was signed a week from tonight, okay? NASA created for space activities. And there's the great promotion that came out in all the battles that he had won by making it a non-military project, which was extraordinary under the circumstances that he was in. Um, I think we also have to say about Ike is he knew the military types and that they would use anything to create absolute chaos. Um, and that's why in his departing message to Kennedy and the nation, he says, beware the military industrial complex, which is really quite remarkable considering he was, you know, the general in World War II. He's basically saying, watch out for these rats. Um, so what happens is this all starts to come together where Hapgood writes a letter and finds out about the Pira Reis map and finds out that it was a copy of the map that Columbus had used to discover America. And then he starts to realize in his investigation, well, the Pira Reis map, which was by the Turkish Admiral Pira Reis, and the, the map is from 1513, but it shows the whole globe as surveyed by a satellite. So it's a very advanced culture that did this. And one of the key things that uh, Hapgood realizes about it is that the map shows Antarctica with no ice on it, which is remarkable. It's tropical. Uh, and Bimini is very prominent in it as well. Now, um, I've done shows with Graham Hancock. Uh, we had him here in Cambridge, and we're, we're having more coming up with him. But um, basically, fundamentally, the ancient maps are the big key to how we uncover and uncork the idea that there was an advanced culture back there, because if they were capable of mapping the whole world, they must have had the advanced technology. It changes our entire view of history. Um, so here we have this extraordinary map of Pyrrhus. And um, what I think one of the things that we want to do when we think about Pyrrhus is we want to have this idea that this is actually a map that probably goes back to the Library of Alexandria that was destroyed. And all of its revelations were basically copied down and kept in monasteries. Now, um, when we find the story of Gurdjieff talking about how he discovers the Sarmon Brotherhood, he does the same thing. He basically pays a bishop to give him a copy of this map that's being held in a monastery, and that's how he finds the Sarmon Brotherhood. The map was 2,000 years old. Um, these maps had to be very ancient. So what they were looking at were copies and, um, Columbus got him, his hands on a copy. Columbus was very aware that America was there, probably had made trips already. Uh, and that's something 
that Dr. Joseph Farrell came forward. Um, we did a series of interviews about that, but uh, the book is Thrice Great Hermetica and he goes into great detail. And it's basically obvious that the Templars had come over here a long time uh, previous to Columbus coming over. And when Columbus starts talking about how he wants to discover America, he knows so much about it. And I think the idea is that there was a gold operation uh, going on here and that they just wanted to run that through before they discovered it officially. Miss Olivia? I know this is from a little while ago, but Deputy yeah. McAdoo wanted to know, where are the figurines now? Oh. Um, there are 33,000 of them. It's pretty interesting. There still are museums down there in central Mexico that house uh, these ruins. There was an update, I think, from 1999 on them. I haven't seen anything more recent than that, although I saw someone um, posting pictures that were from 2012, I think. But the figurines are still down there in various uh, museum collections, and uh, I don't think any of them are here in the United States, but uh, definitely in Mexico, we still have them. Okay. Um, so what we have then is we're trying to figure out what Eisenhower was doing with this Pira Reis map. And what happens is we discover that Hapgood wrote him a letter and said, look, uh, I've used now this Naval Academy. I've suggested to them different things in relation to my calculations about Antarctica and all the rest of this. I think this map is very important. And so interestingly enough, Ike takes him seriously, probably because of his association with Einstein. And he sends over his ambassador to Spain to pressure them. And the tactics used are aggressive. It's not a lightweight suggestion. He talks about how important it is to the United States to get their hands on this thing. So a big back and forth uh, goes down. And I have the, the documents of that back and forth. Now, um, I'll read just a little bit of the message that... Uh, Hapgood sent to Eisenhower, because I think it'll put us in the right <laughs> frame of mind in the hot zone. Everyone, you're watching Dark Journalist Series 129. This is the X series. We're going deep in the hot zone with Albert Einstein and our friend Charles Hapgood, who really uh, changed histories in many ways, but came close to changing it even more. Okay, for several centuries, this is to President Dwight D. Eisenhower from Charles H. Hapgood, professor of history, subject the Pira Reis world map of 1513 and the lost map of Columbus. For several centuries, scholars have been searching for the lost map of Christopher Columbus. The map is referred to by Columbus contemporaries by the historian Lacassus as one he used to navigate to the new world. In 1929, a map was discovered in the former imperial palace in Constantinople, anchored by a Turkish admiral of the 16th century, Pira Reis. In the inscriptions written in the map, the author states that the western part showing the American coasts was copied from a map that had been in the possession of Christopher Columbus, but which had fallen into the hands of Pira Reis, with the booty seized from eight Spanish ships captured by him in a battle off the coast of Valencia in 1501. The Pira Reis map, a copy of which accompanies this memo, attracted the attention of President Ottokirk of the American, and the American Secretary of State Henry Stimson, who in 1932 asked the Turkish government for a color facsimile of the map. So look, when we talk about the hot zone, and I bring it back to Casey's early predictions, mention of Bimini, 1929, 1930, uh, 1926 even, then... Uh, Thomas Townsend Brown in Cuba, 1930, doing deep sea submersible ex experiments. Einstein in Cuba, 1932. Henry Stimson is here already asking for this map in 1932. They already know the association around the hot zone and all the rest of it, and what we call the early version of the archaeological wars, which are so famous with the looting of the Baghdad Museum and things that came later. Okay, another quick flash. I'm enclosing a separate account of an incident. Uh, it seems that in 1893, at the time of the Columbian Exposition in Chicago, the Spanish government built and sent to America replicas of Columbus's three ships. 
The caravels were sailed across the Atlantic and through the Great Lakes to Chicago. It was there that Mr. Campbell and his father were invited, as he describes in detail, to see Columbus's own map in the chart room of the Santa Maria. So they had this map and they sort of traded it in circles behind the scenes. But the impact of this map and the fact that it shows this advanced culture made it a really incredible hot potato, just too much of a political football. Uh, in addition to this important purpose of clearing up many mysteries relating to the discovery of, Mer of America, this is interesting too. He's getting at that. We have another purpose in asking that a search be made for a map now. Studies of the map by various scholars have shown that it contains many details that were not known to geographers in 1513. These indicate that the map must descend from maps made in very ancient times and that navigators, possibly of Phoenician origin, discovered and explored the coasts of America a millennium before the Christian era. This, of course, tends to give support to the tradition of Columbus brought a map from the old world. It seems that Columbus left the old world with quite a good map of America in his pocket. Um, so he goes into this detail and he talks about how Antarctica doesn't have any ice on it in the map and how that's very significant. And it seems like Eisenhower flips out. He is all over this, and he sends his ambassador to get this. Now, what happens is uh, the trail on Hapgood's side fades out, and we never hear about what happened as a result of this. Probably they got the map, and they used it to uh, further their information around the hot zone and other areas dealing with Atlantis. But what happens is Hapgood's not satisfied, so once Eisenhower gets out of office... Now there's a new approach to the Kennedy administration, and here's how that goes. Uh, according to Colin Wilson, around 1958, Hapgood identified a location a thousand miles off the mouth of the Orinoco River in South America, known as the Rocks of St. Peter, and he called it the site of Atlantis. These islands lie above the mid-Atlantic range and according to Hapgood are the remnants of a large island now submerged. He attempted to persuade President Kennedy to assist with a U.S. Navy exploration of the area around the rocks of St. Peter. But the assassination of Kennedy uh, put paid any possibility of any help from the White House. Hapgood's second controversial offering was his belief that the Earth's crust had shifted. Um, so now here's what's interesting. Hapgood, through this association with Einstein and probably through his own connection to the OSS when he came up, his research coming off the Casey readings and coming off his deeper belief system, we'll find out later that he puts out all these spiritual books and then he works with Elwood Babbitt, who is basically this kind of Cambridge psychic. Now, what's interesting when we look at what Hapgood is doing in all this is he's putting things on record. And he's saying publicly to Eisenhower, we need to get this Pura Reese map back. But he's also putting these hot zone pieces on the record. And furthermore, he's asking now uh, for the president to authorize the Navy to go investigate what he feels are ruins from sunken Atlantis, but in South America. So um, that whole piece is remarkable and you know, if you take him from his early association with Einstein, Einstein supporting him, through this whole Pira Reese thing and him making the Pira Reese map a central thing. How many programs have you watched where they use the Pira Reese map? I mean, it's a dramatic uh, discovery that Hapgood makes. And again, his concept of the pole shift way beyond its time. So this guy is operating on very, uh, you know, with a very special radar, shall we say. And we're going to find out exactly what that is all about. Uh, everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist program we're here in X-Series 129 for you. I'm going to be taking your questions here very shortly. I'm trying to get through this. Uh, I'm dancing as fast as I can, mm -hmm. as I say. Um, in the meantime, Miss Olivia, you're up. David Tormina, DJ, was Einstein working with Sarbacher and Brown as a member of the Caroline Group, or was he like a deep state liaison to other deep UFO file factions? Well, it seems like when you see the threads between the people who are operating in the hot zone, um, it seems like there's an association early, 1930. So um, I find the presence of 
uh, Eisenhower, I'm sorry, Einstein and T.T. Um, Brown there in Cuba so early on is a definite indicator. But we know also that Hemingway and JFK are the group that comes after that. So uh, we've got this early setup and then we have the ongoing piece. But one of the things about that yacht, the Caroline, and the secret mission that Thomas Townsend Brown is on is when he gets on that ship and he's talking to the captain, the captain, uh, you know, this billionaire who's just, <laughs> God knows what actual, what he's actually doing there. But um, he brings out a perfectly pristine original copy of Alice in Wonderland and it's in a glass casing. And uh, one of the things that Thomas Townsend Brown asks him when he does this is, what, you know, what is the casing? What's this all about? And he said, well, don't you understand? If the ship goes down, Alice in Wonderland goes on. So there's all sorts of, you know, considering the work that um, Thomas Townsend Brown would go on to do, including being associated with the UFO file, the Philadelphia experiment, uh, deep projects, and even time travel experiments, you know, his setup there in Cuba shows again right in the heart of it. Let's not forget the colonel himself went to Cuba. <laughs> it's one of the first things that he does when he's 19 years old and he goes there as a soldier. Um, so we know that there's some mystery operative and it seems like Cuba is sort of the fingerprint of the whole thing as we get into it. And it's usually Cuba, Bimini, you know, Florida. It's something in that range. One of the other things I want to mention is, you know, a lot of people, including um, Lindbergh, for example, who I've pointed out what they were doing in their spare time when they weren't being supermen. They were one of the things that Lindbergh did was he photographed ruins from above of Yucatan. This group of people, they're all clued in to the fact that there's something going on there. What did they do with Gordon Arnold? They had him go up there and look down below at Cuba and what was under Cuba. And the official explanation was you're looking for nuclear this or nuclear that, um, you know, and then he would say, Oh, you know, I remembered Spanish galleons. And I've said before many times, Spanish galleons is the code word for it. there's ruins down there. But since you haven't said, I saw a pyramid of Giza down there, uh, you can't get taken to court or whatever. So, Whenever you hear the Spanish galleons things, yes, there's incredible treasure and there's all these types of things. And there are people who just do that treasure hunting and do it quite well. But uh, Spanish galleons has become the code word. So when we get into a period, you know, let's say, let's take the T.T. Brown thing in 1930. Now let's sweep it up to 2001 and what happens. Fidel Castro brings in Paulina Zelitsky, who was in Cuba but defected to Canada and created her own undersea mapping program. And they say, you know, we want you for Spanish galleon work. <laughs> and uh, they don't want her for that. They want her for the city. And she discovers a whole city off the Western tip of Cuba. As we know, when we follow the hot zone episodes and it's, it's a massive discovery. And eventually she's pushed out, even thrown in a Mexican prison for a little while to really keep her, you know, out of the flow of things. So whatever was going on, uh, was was definitely too hot to handle. But when she sent her deep sea submersibles off the western tip of Cuba, it wasn't like they were looking at a building or even the Bimini Wall, as grand as that is. She said it was a metropolis. There's an entire city off the coast of the western tip of Cuba. That's the problem. And this is also noted by Hemingway's brother when he's flying over Cuba, he sees the exact same thing in the early 50s. So it's like an inside secret. Uh, and this is why we need to figure out what people on this level were doing with it. Now, I've, I've posited two groups at a really high level uh, relating to UFO information. One of them being uh, XProtect, which is a group that will do anything to keep the secret. And the other one being XShare, which I think people like Thomas Brown and JFK emulate quite well. Um, and their idea is to move the culture forward by informing them and having nations work together on this thing and all the rest. Uh, these other groups, the ex-protect groups, basically want to keep the information for themselves. They thrive on disinformation. And um, they also thrive on 
you know, completely destroying reputations and destroying careers. That's what they're really good at. In extreme cases, like Morris Jessup, they just had to get rid of him because he knew too much. So uh, that's what you're dealing with there. And it's always, the expert tech group is always associated around aerospace and the intelligence uh, groups, the deep, you know, covert wing of the CIA. So, um, but that thing has been run into. Even Jim Garrison, uh, when he was investigating President Kennedy's murder, he ran into it. He didn't know exactly what it was, but he's like, you know, there's all this weird aerospace and UFO stuff around these people. What is that about? Um, and that's where you know you're getting hot. And by the way, when we talk about the hot zone, we might be talking about Atlantis and Atlantis ruins and things of this nature. But in essence, what you're really looking at is incredible waves of UFO activity, so common in Bimini that they refer to them as fireflies. Uh, so, you know, there's intense activity around the UFO file dealing uh, particularly in the hot zone. So that's something for us to keep in the back of our heads as we're moving forward. Okay, I'll take about 15 more minutes on this and then we'll jump to questions. Is that okay, sure. reasonable? All right. Do you have anything? Karen Carpenter wants to know, does DJ see factions in the Kennedy family as far as Hemingway, X-Protect, et cetera? There's no question that, uh, you know, RFK Jr. is an incredible truth teller and um, there are people in his family who are trying to take him down for truth telling. But I think that's more because they've been convinced that, you know, not to be controversial and things of this nature. So, yeah, there's a lot of programming, unfortunately. And um, I think we have to be really thankful that we have someone like RFK Jr. out there. Uh, we've had him on the program. He's coming back on the program. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to see some very interesting developments from things that he's working on. But this is somebody who uh, is really one to watch in the middle of all this because of uh, the incredible courage that he's showing carrying on the family legacy uh, dramatically and addressing the deep state assassinations very honestly. You know, his family before that, the traditional thing was to say, well, the Warren Commission, you know, and everyone knew that that was a lie. And he came out and said, well, my father never bought the Warren Commission. And by the way, you know, when I investigated my father's uh, assassination. It was not Sirhan Sirhan that did it. So that's very brave uh, to, to bring that on record. Another GFK piece, I did mention the Ernest Hemingway part. I just want to kind of round that out so we, we understand it. And for those of you familiar with the Hot Zone episodes, you're going to be familiar with this segment, but I want to get this, when we think about uh, Babbitt, when we think about Hapgood, when we think about Einstein, when we think about the colonel's daughter, I want this Hemingway piece to get in there because now we're starting to fill out the picture of what's actually operative there out there in the hot zone. Okay, that is a shot of President Kennedy, and he is with Mary Hemingway after the death, which was originally claimed to be Hemingway cleaning his gun. Um, and Hemingway the night before had said he felt federal agents were chasing him. Something very strange was going on with Ernest, but there's Mary and she goes to Kennedy and says, there's something, there's a huge vault in Cuba and I want to get it back. And trust me, you want to get it back too. Now, the traditional official story is, oh, it was his poems and some extra manuscripts. <laughs> uh, but what happens later is in 2015, a national security document becomes unclassified and it states that President Kennedy spoke with his CIA director, Robert Kennedy, uh, who was the attorney general at the time, and Ed Lansdale, who was like a kind of a deep operative there for the Air Force and the CIA, the covert ops. And the idea was it was for a major foreign policy risk to take place at Hemingway's villa in Cuba after his death. They were going to go there, and there was some incident that they were contemplating. Every one of those JFK researchers and historians like Arthur Schlesinger and all those people associated with with the Kennedy legend, they're like, we have no idea what that is. So um, it only makes sense if Hemingway had something very secret that he had kept there. And what happens is they end up smuggling uh, his legacy out of Cuba on a shrimp boat. <laughs> and But somebody's paid off to look the other way. That's the only way I can think about that one. Um, but it's, it's a matter of record. You know, this is Smithsonian covering it. I mean, it's not even like you have to go very deep 
to find that two inches, that something weird was going on and that Mary Hemingway had done all this singing and dancing to make it happen. Now, there's a guy named Bill Walton who was really close to Hemingway and also a big honcho in the uh, Kennedy circles. This is the guy that I've pegged as the intermediary for a long history between Hemingway and JFK. And um, there's lots of different places, I guess we can go with that. But what I want to point out about it specifically is that it relates to this activity that was going on there, which is a geopolitical hotbed of intrigue having to do with the hot zone. And that's why Ernest Hemingway is there on Bimini. That's why Hemingway's family is so close with the Casey's. And that's why JFK is willing to risk a national security incident to get Hemingway's vault. It's not for some poems, I can tell you that. Um, so, and why is all that Hemingway stuff there at the JFK library? We need to keep the Hemingway uh, piece in there with the Einstein piece when we start to put these um, the real threads together because it's going to make a lot more sense about what their activities were because there are always weird stories about Hemingway going up and down between Bimini and Cuba and surveying the ocean floor. And whenever they asked him, what are you doing? He would say, I'm looking for German U-boats. But the boat that he had was set up for scientific survey. There were no guns on it. If he found a U-boat, what was he going to do except get blown out of the water? It doesn't make any sense. What he was doing was what his brother was doing, who was also a submarine journalist <laughs> in that era. Um, and the brother also has a history of going to Bimini before Ernest. He goes in 1930. Um, now, you could say Bimini was a lovely little <laughs> island, um, but I think the fact that Casey is saying, hey, there's going to be a Poseidon temple coming up here, and uh, the fact that you know these people are there, and then suddenly they're in Cuba and they're putting things away, um, and then when they escape, they, need, they leave behind this huge vault, we have to look at some of those connecting dots to get a picture of what was really happening down there. That's going to help us a lot. Okay, uh, Babbitt. Let's get into this a little bit. Um, so Elwood Babbitt um, is, is important in the story because he becomes kind of like a surrogate Casey in all this. And he would go into trance as Casey did, and he could um, bring forward different types of revelations. And it appears that in the second part of his life, now that um, he, was, he was being used by Hapgood on a regular basis, and they actually built, um, Babbitt helped build a community in Western Mass that were all about farming and all this stuff, and Eventually, that all went away. But um, interestingly enough, it was um, Hapgood's cousin, Beth, who also had very big government connections. And she was the one who was really kind of creating this um, group that was very much associated with, you know, having a wonderful, uh, self-promoting, uh, self-sustaining community and things of this nature. So we have these threads that are going on there. And Babbitt basically in trance is giving uh, Hapgood some answers around his pole shift idea and saying, you know, these are things that are coming in the future and a lot of your work is a setup uh, work and also telling him to use his own psychic ability. And on the record, um, Hapgood says that he had this incredible psychic experience which set him off on this track where he remembered a lifetime of being in Vishnu's temple. Now, this is really heavy duty. Consider the scientific world that he's operating in. And then he comes out with this huge revelation. Well, you know, what's happening is I'm, I'm having these really extraordinary memories of being in the Vishnu temple and how this was a very spiritual, incredible, uh, you know, kind of level of memory of me and he comes to regard his spiritualism to the forefront going forward after all these periods and he's coming out and he's saying you know what i believe that we can solve these things through spiritual endeavor and so babbitt kind of takes him in this very interesting direction and he discovers kind of like his own version of casey in this era um one of the interesting things again 
when we go back to Einstein coming to Cuba and studying astronomy and being there with Hubble, eventually get the Hubble telescope, is there were there in Cuba these very ancient astronomical science. And the person who goes to check them out and study them before she discovers the Cuban city is our friend Paulina Zelitsky. And it is in those caves, some of the oldest uh, drawings there in the hot zone, but they talk about a really heavy duty cosmological uh, incident that took place. And it's a record of that. And so interestingly enough, Zelitsky was locked into this. Uh, just a quick background again, so we understand the city that she discovered. That's what we're talking about here. And she found it off the Western tip of Cuba and she said it was large like a metropolis. And we can see from these over here, uh, that whole thing is just, you know, pyramids. And, you know, I think really any deep investigation of those ruins is going to reveal something truly remarkable. However, uh, you have all this kind of firefighting going on between the Cubans who own that and the United States are trying to get at it. And uh, from what I understand, China and uh, Russia and a lot of other people are trying to get at those ruins as well. Earlier, we mentioned Jacques Cousteau's uh, granddaughter and how she was targeted by the Epstein Maxwell gang. That is uh, Alexandra Cousteau. And there's no question that they had basically set her up and were trying to get compromising material on her she stands out pretty mightily if you look at Virginia Giuffre's testimony. She's the one who doesn't make sense because what we're looking at is somebody who is not on the level of Bill Clinton, is not on the level of Lex Wexner, any of these guys. She is basically just, you know, the granddaughter of this major figure whose big quest was Atlantis. <laughs> so uh, when we're starting to kind of put these together, we start to see Cousteau and the revelation that she was targeted by this group is a big key. It's something we didn't have until that deposition came out against Prince Andrew. You see how the information around the hot zone works. If you get one piece in there, just like the Marvin Minsky piece, which Jufre brought out as well, then we're able to connect all these other dots, including uh, that huge dot with the Colonel's daughter. Everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist Show. This is X-Series 129. It's great to have uh, everyone out there. <laughs> see a lot of familiar faces. And uh, we're going to be taking your questions momentarily here. i got a couple more things to add uh, to our X-Series 129. I want to remind you to go to darkjournalist.com and sign up for our newsletter if you haven't already. Uh, that keeps us in touch. And it also uh, will let you know about the exciting interviews. And I mean, these are very powerful interviews coming up. You're going to want to be uh, stand up and be counted for that. So make sure that you sign up for that newsletter. And um, like I said, it's free and you'll get it on Fridays, just letting you know if we have any special reports or X-Series episodes coming up for you. And we have some incredible uh, X series episodes coming up for the rest of the summer. And, um, I mentioned the, uh, interviews, but we have some remarkable, um, documentary pieces coming out for the fall along with some events coming up. And I guess I can mention this now, which is next Wednesday. <laughs> I'm going to be on Sean Atwood's, uh, show. They invited me there. They originally invited me there and then he wasn't there. Uh, so somebody else interviewed me and then he came back and said, well, will you do it again? So I, I don't do a lot of interviews, but I'm going to do this one because uh, we're so happy about our friends over there in the UK. And uh, so we're, that's coming up next Wednesday. So we'll let you know all about that. Yes, Miss Olivia. Um, Summer Forever wants to know, uh, did Onassis know about Cuba? And Ogum 5 says, yes, he was a business associate of Sam Rompman and oh, yeah. provided him ships. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> we have, we've been talking for years about uh, doing the Onassis show, which we've never actually done. Well, Onassis is in that kind of similar position as Maxwell in a sense, but bigger, you know, even more tentacles and really established for a long time. Um, but whenever you get that kind of floating thing going on where it's like a floating government <laughs> Uh, this gets us also to an episode we have coming on, which um, which is Hubbard in the Hot Zone. 
and that's also about a floating kingdom in search of Atlantis. Uh, yeah, there's no question that when you're dealing, I can tell you things go really deep because if you think about the gemstone file, they basically lay every deep state track in the world on our friend Onassis. And um, I think the the insight that's in there is remarkable. I don't agree that um, all the deep state stuff was the result of Onassis. There's just no way. But it is interesting that as much information is coming through that gemstone file, they're still trying to target Onassis and make him like the fall guy for everything. Uh, but wow, really hardcore. And then ending up marrying uh, Jackie Kennedy and then his son dying in a plane crash. I mean, just an incredible uh, affair. And as far as Bronfman goes, forget it, because that brings you in deep uh, and that brings you in very deep with the Nexium. Uh, cult and also with the Montreal mafia. And uh, if you know what that is, you're getting into the whole uh, sort of Permandex legacy, shall we say. Very interesting. What else you got? Timothy Guessing wants to know, uh, does DJ have any thoughts about Ignatius Donnelly? Yeah, Donnelly is remarkable. Here's a congressman in Minnesota in the 1870s, around the time that Blavatsky is coming forward with the Theosophical Society and really bringing this around um, and giving us this incredible information. But Donnelly, he writes this uh, antediluvian world book, which is all about Atlantis. And he compares and shows the language on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, mimicking what was there as a major legacy culture in the middle. So he's, he really takes things on the record and it becomes the classic. And uh, he even runs for president at one point. Think about that the author of a famous Atlantis book in the 19th century is running for president. I mean, uh, some of the stuff was a little more out of the closet in a way, as much as it was hard to talk about. Um, oddly enough, there were less filters also. So there's this kind of interesting thing, but yeah, I think the book is a classic. There's an edition that has been re-edited by Egerton Sykes that came out, uh, I think in the sixties and it gives you, you know, some of that real uh, excellent insight by Sykes as well, which I think is crucial and was a missing link. You know, when I talk about the UFO file and I talk about uh, Atlantis ruins and the lost continent and the hot zone and Poseidia and things of this nature, there's been a lot that's been missed. There's been great research, but it's also, it's hard because you need continuity of great uh, research. And what you get are these flashes of brilliance and somebody comes forward, you know, like Zelitsky has this great thing, but then there's no support around that. And then, uh, you know, there are other people who come forward with great information, but then there's no support. And then in the UFO field, that was done intentionally to kind of impoverish the field so that the CIA could roll in someday and say, like, don't worry, you'll all get book deals. <laughs> uh, and it's clever, but... In terms of a field, I think the Atlantis uh, study, you know, for a while when Graham Hancock was doing all his books on a lost continent and everything, he was targeted by PSYCOP, uh, which is a CIA run discrediting disinformation unit that had like the amazing Randy and, and people like that, skeptic society or whatever. And you expect normal skeptic societies and things, but this thing would target them so that if he was going to a university to give a lecture about this, that they would try to get a boycott going for the university. You know, this is how they used to operate to keep these things down. So whenever they go out and they start talking and saying, we want to give you UFO disclosure, you know, uh, it feels that's like going into the lion's mouth, right? You don't want to do that. That's a lot. Those are the last people you want to trust with anything important to humanity. And what's interesting is that it's a, it's a reflection also that we can do so much of this ourselves and that we can get a great deal. We have incredible, um, you know, people to work with and depending on how things go, if the discoveries are big enough, even the mainstream has to accept it at a certain point. Uh, as we found out with the Nixon Trump relationship, we put that on the record in 2018 and they were all like, you know, there was no relationship, you know, nothing like that. And then in 2020, all the letters come out through the Nixon foundation. So that's the way it works. You know, you take your shot, you put the stuff up there and you're proved right or wrong. And that's, that's what we're doing here. <laughs> all right. Anything else? 
you you cannot bring up Antarctica without people going crazy. I mean, it's, you know, it doesn't matter what else we're talking about. So James Clement uh, says, what does DJ think they're hiding from us in Antarctica when governments <laughs> of the world have a treaty banning citizens from going there? And Jay Vandervest wants to know why Google Maps is trying to hide Antarctica. And they were fact checking a photo from, sp uh, yes. from space, the story going around. That was a phony um, Photoshop photo, right? Or they said it was it's very weird. Things People seem to there. think that you know that you have the answers and that you're holding back because of <laughs> security fears. Uh, well, I have suspicions for sure. Here's the thing. And uh, I, I talked with Dr. Farrell about this when it came to Antarctica. And he was the one who was talking so much about these high level figures, including the Russian Pope who had gone to Antarctica. And that was in 2015. He wrote a series of blogs and, um, you know, the Corey Good gang and all those people um, suddenly everything was about Antarctica and they were, they were riffing off of everything that Farrell had put out along with a bunch of other people. And what's interesting is um, fundamentally, when you look at the high level visitors who went to Antarctica, think of the things that they're associated with. Buzz Aldrin was what? An astronaut. Um, then if you go a little bit deeper, then John Kerry, he was what? Secretary of State. By the way, he was setting up relations with Cuba at the same time. Um, then you have a religious figure, the Russian Pope. So you've got space, you've got religion, and you've got, you know, political statesmen. That's kind of interesting. So that alone gives you kind of the steganography of the moment. When Biden went to meet the Pope and he talked about Satchel Page, and we did all of those interpretations of the steganography going on there. That's pretty interesting because what it lets us know is that they were talking about Mars, whatever it was. And so whatever they were going to try, well, we've discovered this thing on Mars. You know, I'm sure they've made discoveries relating to Mars and the moon a long, long time ago. And that anything that they're going to do now in relation to that has an op behind it. Check the work of Gigi Young, for example. She knows very well from studying what they've been doing. And so she has very, you know, uh, kind of a, a truly uh, insightful version of what's happening for what they're doing with the Mars narrative, and that is the ancient gods thing. So they have, you know, the no god thing, you know, there's no god, the scientific materialism. Then they have them as gods. <laughs> and then uh, once in a while, you catch one of these UFO in, intel people, you know, like Elizondo, of the CIA crowd, and they'll come out and say, well, it's not just aliens in space, you know, it's aliens underwater too. So they kind of, they want the menu, the buffet set for which one they want to use. And uh, I'm absolutely convinced that they have a false version of Atlantis uh, coming up, you know, and uh, I feel bad that the, the alternative field doesn't have the edge. When I think about, you know, people that I've known who've passed on like Stanton Friedman and others, they were very sharp about government disinformation. This crowd that's left over is either wants to be a part of the gang or they just, they don't have the chops and they don't understand about deep state uh, and that kind of research. And it's bothersome because I think it's a, it leaves the public open to a big gulf of disinformation. And there should be people on the UFO side saying, oh, there's a lot of narratives out here. And guess what? Most of them are psyops. Doesn't mean... And that's the problem because where, you know, the establishment has kept them down by not admitting these things exist. And so their work has been marginalized to the fringes. And so now they have an opportunity because the same group is like, hey, you know, come on back. We want to use you. And those people are like, hey, my life's work, you know. But unfortunately, these people are going to use it for a totally different thing. As a matter of fact, the ultimate irony of the UFO hearing in May, when they came forward with the idea saying, you know what we're going to do? We're going to ban amateur interest groups and punish them. Let's figure out a way to punish them. And then the DOD official says, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, so the irony is that the same people you know, in the UFO field who spent all this time promoting the CIA LARPer people... Um, they're going to be the same ones who will tell them, Hey, you can't study anymore. <laughs> you know, I, mean, it's, it's pretty weird. It's a weird scene. Department of Homeland Security, not to go off on a tangent, but let's just take a look at this for a second. Quarter of a million employees. 
has anybody looked into this organization and what they're up to? And now they want to take over the UFO file. I mean, uh, you know, we need a lot more inquiry into what's going on. And with the revelations about the CIA attempting the assassination of Assange, we need a whole new investigation of the central intelligence agencies and their covert operations and uh, executive action programs. They should start that day one. I don't understand why with those revelations out there, it's not happening. Um, not to mention, you know, the ultimate irony, you have records from the Kennedy assassination sitting out there was 59 years ago and you still can't get at them. Uh, <laughs> and it's supposed to be a democracy. I mean, it's ridiculous. So, you know, something, there has to be an awakening there in the power of the people, you know, influencing the system. That's all I can say. Okay. Uh, when, okay. When yeah. Nick Malone okay. uh, says, does Daniel know that Einstein's favorite book was ISIS Unveiled? By Blavatsky. Oh, right. He did. He had um, he had a fascination for it. And think about that, because that is a great thing to bring up. Um, also, the fact that he had that association, uh, Edison had the association with the Theosophical Society. There's a long trail of scientific uh, people understanding the depth of the work of theosophy. And... Um, Theosophy, I think they're starting to catch up on. Uh, that's happening now. I've mentioned this before about J. Allen Hynek, but I really think it goes deep. And it was one of those things that was very eye-opening for me when I discovered it, which is that there's a conversation that Linda Moulton Howe has with um, him before he dies. And this is very interesting because, you know, when we look um, back to the UFO part and we see uh, all the obfuscation that was going on. There were periods in time like the late seventies where, you know, Heineck and people like that thought, finally, I'm going to be the one who can come forward and, you know, close encounters is the movie. It got the public ready and we're going to do this. And then the plug gets pulled. <laughs> so they did this uh, over and over again. And, but Heineck said to Linda, when she asked him, what's the most important UFO book? And he said, it's, Theosophy by Rudolf Steiner, which is a book that Steiner wrote in 1907. That's pretty deep um, for him to the, come to that conclusion. Why did that sort of ultimate UFO expert, after having gone through the government obfuscation programs and all those cases and all those things, why did he regard Steiner's Theosophy as the ultimate UFO book? So I think that puts our vision back uh, to the Theosophy book and understanding, you know, what's active there. Now, again, um, you know, the modern times call for modern solutions. You can't get all the answers from a book that was written a hundred years ago. What you can get is that foundation that the mystery schools uh, have left behind through the work of Casey. And so much of it is bearing fruit now um, as we get a better understanding of the hot zone and all the rest of it. The reason that's not there randomly, it's not, um, something that's just, you know, supposed to be kind of something that, of interest, you know, it's supposed to be um, culture changing. It'll help us to understand the fact that once we had an incredible advanced culture and it destroyed itself and that we've arrived back at this place and that there's a deep message that that culture left behind for us, that's world changing. And uh, the technological aspects, the spiritual aspects, the whole thing, I think uh, it's remarkable when we get into that. Yes. All right. I'm going to wrap up this section and then we're going to take more of your questions. Anything else over there? Timothy Lang. So the astronaut guy who saw all the quote Spanish galleons from space and wrote down the coordinates for the treasure hunter probably saw the city off Cuba. I'm guessing. I would think so. <laughs> I would think that that's what Kennedy had sent him up there to look at. Um, and he, you know, he remembered Gordon Cooper he remembered all those and they turned it into a program called Gordon's treasures, I think. And, uh, there's a guy who had met him just before he died and got his hands on some of that. And, uh, you know, that turns into a whole thing about Spanish galleons. <laughs> uh, but I have a feeling that when we get Cooper in the hot zone that you are looking at a real, you know, 
they want to use the space program now to apprehend what was going on here. And that the things that happen in relation to the Atlantis revelations are actually just as important, if not more important, than what is going on in relation to UFO disclosure, because it's about us and it's about our abilities and our past. And the fact that we attained this incredible uh, spiritual level in Atlantis through the technology, through the two eye stone, as Casey talks about, and then we lost it. And through the actions of the Belial group, they destroyed everything. And we had to start all over. That's significant. And I think that that story has been suppressed in a mad <laughs> frenzy by archaeological and educational groups. Uh, so <laughs> that's a deep story. Okay, let's see. Let's see how we can wrap this up. Okay. Um, the White House acts. This is just a quick thing around the fact that our friend Hapgood got Eisenhower to go ahead and pressure Spain. Um, but let's see what was going on there. When we reviewed Hapgood's correspondence contained in present, this is Atlantis beneath the ice. When we reviewed Hapgood's correspondence contained in Eisenhower's archives, we discovered that the White House did in fact fall through on Hapgood's memorandum. The U.S. State Department, on orders from Eisenhower, directed the American ambassador in Spain, John David Lodge, to pursue the matter. Ambassador Lodge's younger brother, Henry Cabot Lodge, was Richard Nixon's vice presidential running mate during the 1960 campaign. So both sides, the Kennedy side and the Nixon side, are very aware of this push-pull around the original Columbus map. Uh, Lodge followed through on the presidential order. Unfortunately, the Spanish authorities came up empty-handed. This is what the official story is. With the election of President Kennedy in 1960, the dynamics in Washington changed. The new administration uh, wasn't able to pursue Hapgood's quest. Hapgood never knew what happened. Instead, he devoted a decade to writing Maps of Atlantis, Ancient Sea Kings, Evidence of Advanced Civilization in the Ice Age. Uh, the preface begins... This book contains the story of the discovery of first, the first hard evidence that advanced peoples preceded all the peoples now known in history. This is crucial. In one field, ancient sea charts, it appears that accurate information has been passed down from people to people. It becomes clear that the ancient voyagers traveled from pole to pole as unbelievable as it may appear. Um, and I have another quote from that book. I highly recommend this book, which has all of the uh, ancient sea maps in it, along with Hapgood's extraordinary commentary. And the fact that he put this together, I think, is a true marvel. Um, and <laughs> interestingly enough, I'm going to read Einstein writing the foreword for his book. All right, so this is Einstein talking about Hapgood. I frequently receive communication from people who wish to consult me concerning their unpublished ideas. It goes without saying that these ideas are very seldom possessed of scientific validity. The very first communication, however, that I received from Mr. Hapgood electrified me. His idea is original, of great simplicity, and if it continues to prove itself, of great importance to everything that is related to the history of the Earth's surface. A great many empirical data indicate that at each point on the Earth's surface that has been carefully studied, many climactic changes have taken place, apparently quite suddenly. This, according to Hapgood, is explicable if the virtually rigid outer crust of the Earth undergoes from time to time extensive displacement from the vicious, viscous plastic, possibly fluid, inner layers." Such displacements may take place as the consequences of comparatively slight forces exerted on the crust derived from the Earth's momentum of rotation, which in turn will tend to alter the axis of rotation of the Earth's crust. And he goes on forward. But you can see, one, there, the reverence that Einstein is giving. Remember, he's the top scientist. He's giving to Hapgood all this credit, and he's saying the thing he's discovered is absolutely crucial. And fundamentally, this idea of displacement gives us the whole pole shift activity in that everything can shift and that it happens quickly. <laughs> and that what tends to happen is that humanity falls behind and loses the civilization that they have. 
all this information rising to the surface gives us the impression through the mystery schools, et cetera, that we're moving now into a period that is similar. And this might be uh, more of a gradual than a cataclysmic activity, but we're in that window, we're in that envelope where we're going to see a lot of earth changes. And um, that's something that's a kind of a central piece with what the mystery schools left. So then we look at that and we say, what are they trying to tell us? Prepare for it or avoid it somehow. Is it inevitable or is there a mechanism uh, with us, with humanity itself, to stop it? This is where the conversation around the mystery schools and the actions of these figures becomes even that much deeper. So now I am going to top it off with Edgar Casey discussing the two-eye stone, and then we're going to take it on your questions. Uh, in the meantime, you can give me a question because I've got this. This is a question, but I did want to throw this in. Thomas Tyson yeah. said there's uh, the photo of Einstein in his, on his bicycle at Caltech was taken from my grandmother's driveway house where I was born. Unbelievable. That is extraordinary. We have extraordinary people in the ideas room. Talk about those connections. I mean, that <laughs> amazing. Hmm. Uh, I've had people write to me who'd had readings with Babbitt. And um, very interestingly, Babbitt, uh, Elwood Babbitt, lived <laughs> right above a like a burger joint <laughs> over here in Harvard Square. And uh, it's just interesting to think of, you know, this guy floating around here. And um, what's also interesting is in that same building, Priscilla McMillan, who was the big disinformation woman around uh, Lee and Marina Oswald, she wrote her opus, uh, you know, Priscilla's, um, Marina's book on Oswald right there in that same <laughs> apartment building. So it's just weird the way these things come up. And uh, I'm often reminded when I walk around here because, uh, you know, you've got John F. Kennedy Street and John F. Kennedy Park and the Kennedy School and, and all these, these different things. Um, Hemingway Hall. Hemingway, yes. Mm -hmm. And... Um, then you also get, you know, uh, Avi Loeb's little astrophysics lab. And you have, you know, like, it's a weird uh, thing. It's sort of like you're studying the stuff and it's all around you at the same time. It's, a, it's an interesting feeling, I can tell you that. Um, not to mention the uh, Swedenborg stuff. Okay. And trust me, there's going to be a Swedenborg episode. <laughs> Here we go. Uh Here's the question about the two-eye stone. Again, T-U-A-O-I. The two-eye stone is the Atlantean power crystal, and the sons of Belial have kind of hijacked it for nefarious purposes when the Amelius group was using it to attune to the outer spheres and uh, the outer spheres and the saintly realm. So they had prepared priestesses to interact with this higher spiritual power. It was the same exact technology, but... The other way to use it was, you know, you could use it as a gigantic laser, fundamentally. So when they asked Casey, what was the two-eye stone? What was the shape or form was it? It was in the form, Casey says, of a six-sided figure in which the light appeared as the means of communication between infinity and the finite, or the means whereby there were the communications with those forces from the outside. Later, this came to mean that from which the energies radiated, the center of which were the radial activities guiding the various forms of transition or travel through those periods of activity of the Atlanteans. It was set as a crystal, though in quite a different form from that used there. Do not confuse these two, for there were many generations of difference. It was in those periods when there was the directing of airplanes or means of travel through these, in that time, would travel in the air or on the water or under the water just the same, yet the force from which these were directed was in the central power station or the two-eye stone, which was as the beam upon which it acted. In the beginning, it was the source from which there was a spiritual and mental contact. What happens is after the Belial groups are using it for destruction. It becomes known as the terrible crystal. And there is an echo in the Bible. There's a couple of references to the terrible crystal, which is odd in that sense. And with that, Miss Olivia, 
I am turning it over to you. Okay, George Ivankovich, did Einstein withhold a true part of physics and slides of his brain are held where? I forget where. Well, that's an interesting one. Um, <laughs> there's weird stuff about Einstein's brain just whenever we get into that. I will tell you this, that um, I have a letter from Einstein to his daughter where he talks about things that will have to, future generations will have to deal with and that he can't let out now. So that part is absolutely on record. Um, and I could read part of that letter because it's interesting. The other thing that's interesting about Einstein's letters um, is his secretary goes on the record before she dies and says, oh yeah, since they're talking about Roswell, you know, they called him in <laughs> and they asked him to examine this wreckage too. And she's straight on uh, giving that background. So, you know, we really, um, we really have to understand that whenever they got into the UFO file, the X technology, the people that were always there, Vannevar Bush, Albert Einstein, Oppenheimer, um, there was a whole group that was dedicated to dealing with this. And then finally they were kind of used and abused, you know, so that the different types that seemed to gain ascendancy later were the Edward Teller types. And uh, he <laughs> just seemed of a more devious. Dark. Uh, <laughs> I would say so. It's interesting. Uh, Oppenheimer's comments about um, Einstein are very telling because one of the things that he says about him is that, you know, he was childlike. He was kind of innocent. He was never, he never tried to put on airs. He never pretended to be cultural or worldly or anything like that. He just seemed like a very innocent guy. Um, so here's a quick ex excerpt from Einstein to his daughter, which might answer your question a little bit. Quote, when I proposed the theory of relativity, very few people understood me. And what I will reveal now in order to be transmitted to humanity will also be confronted with the misunderstanding and prejudice of the world. I ask you to keep the letters for as many years, decades as necessary until society has advanced enough to accept what I will explain below. Now there's a whole section of things that he goes into. And I recommend this whole love is light, um, you know, uh, love unfolds and reveals. He has a great realization about love in his letters. And he's very anti, uh, even though he, got America involved in developing the atomic bomb. He's doing everything he can to create a peaceful world. And uh, in fact, Dr. Nathan, who I referenced earlier, writes a book called Einstein on Peace in 1960, five years after his death, which is remarkable. And I think we need the keys to that peace now uh, with the world the way it is. But uh, maybe I'll read more of that later. Go ahead. Okay. So Tom Talley says Einstein's handler's agenda was to destroy ether physics so they could charge for quote, limited resources and create artificial scarcity. Yeah. I'm sure there was a lot of that in it because they got rid of ether uh, as, as a possibility. And if you look really at Tesla's work and John Keeley, um, the advances that they had made at the end of the 19th century, things would have gone very differently. That's also true with psychology because uh, people like Charcot were taking it totally different places than Freud. And um, so when we look at that, you would have a very different society. One that was aware of the subconscious and access to the subconscious as a way to access the astral plane. And then you'd also be thinking about technology that was self-sustaining. Or in the case of Tesla, wireless technology that could be beamed the same way wireless uh, communications were. So you could do that with energy. So there wouldn't be any need for oil. <laughs> uh, so that's a real big, you know, F you to the establishment. That's a problem. It's a real big problem. And JP Morgan took care of the problem by getting rid of Tesla's lab. Um on a couple of occasions, yes. Steve Bosco says, hey, DJ, is there any truth to the story that Einstein was asked, how does it feel to be the smartest person in the world? Allegedly, he responded, you'd have to ask Nikola Tesla. <laughs> that sounds to me like, I mean, it's definitely true, but uh, it sounds to me like one of those things that floats around the alternative media <laughs> and doesn't have any provenance. You ever see that one that shows Kennedy and it says, there's a conspiracy against every man, woman, and child. And before I leave this office, I'm going to find it out. Look, Kennedy said very hardcore, important things. And he did talk about um, how 
you know, secrecy is repugnant and all the rest. But sometimes people just make up quotes and stick Kennedy's picture on it, you know. So what I would say, just like with the Casey readings, um, you know, it's always good to provide the number of the Casey readings. And it's always good online to, if uh, JFK makes a, a quote, ta- if you're taking it from a particular speech or Lincoln or anybody, you know, what's the date of the speech or what's the kind of setup for it? Uh, not too much, but just, you know, give us something. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just something that sounds good. But um, I, I think in relation to uh, Einstein, he has some very funny quotes. One is about the tax system where he said, you don't need to be a mathematician to do your taxes. You have to be a philosopher because for math, it doesn't make any sense. And uh, he definitely has a hardcore biting sense of humor. Yes. I love this. This is so fascinating. Katie Cat says, uh, Einstein had more convolution folds at right brain hemisphere and less developed on the left side. He had dyslexia and his brain overcompensated on the right side, enhancing his ability for physics. Interesting. Wow. Um, you, we just always think science left brain, right? But yes. th- that is damn interesting. Um, I'm sure, you know, I've read about his thought experiments and these are interesting too, because he's like, I have to draw out how my brain works. <laughs> this is interesting. So, you know, he'll picture himself as a train going fast when he has an interesting idea and he draws a train or he pictures himself jumping off a building when he gets something wrong, you know, all this weird picture association stuff. And then I think very often about uh, Tesla's appreciation for Goethe's poetry and how there's a line in um, I think the green snake and the lily where Goethe says again and again, and that's how he got alternating current. And he had such a freak out that he has to draw it on the ground. He's with a friend and he draws it on the ground with a stick. Uh, This is interesting too, that people who knew Einstein say that he lived very simply, that he, you know, wasn't caught up in extravagant living. And I think that's part of having these great insights as well is not being too surrounded. And I remember there was a great musician um, and Einstein said that he wanted to be a musician, interestingly enough, and that he would have actually been happier and that music was the only thing that made him happy. Um, But there's a musician who comes to Casey and he's saying, I want to do this incredible opus and all the rest. And Casey says, well, look, don't go to the cinema, sleep on a hard bed, you know, don't pamper yourself, don't drink, you know, just so while you're doing this and then when you're done with it, go back to whatever (laughs) you were doing. But when you're in this window for getting that deeper inspiration, you don't want anything from the outside to overwhelm you. So I thought it was interesting. He said, don't go to the cinema because, um, you know, I mean, I, I love movies, but you can see how when you're trying to formulate deep ideas, uh, you can be very much overpowered by somebody else's impressions. But I thought that, you know, the, the whole idea, it's like, you know, make it uncomfortable for yourself. Well, this goes kind of the, the Gurdjieff route, which is Gurdjieff is saying, when you're in a situation where you're not comfortable, that's when you're going to come face to face with your buffers and figure them out. So very often when they put schools together of people, they weren't types that complemented each other necessarily. So they had to kind of deal with it. You know, this person annoys me, but I have to deal with them. Well, I've been in a lot of work situations like that, <laughs> but not anymore. Go ahead. Ogham five. Um, so how much, if anything, does Hapgood know about the outcome of Burden Forstall's Operation High Jump? Well, it's interesting because um, the... Uh, that comes up over and over again. And in fact, Thomas Townsend Brown was invited uh, along with Bird. Bird wanted him in 1932. Think about that. So uh, Hapgood becomes very obsessive about the Antarctica piece, but he feels like over and over again when he's doing these high level letters and stuff like that, until he gets under that umbrella of Einstein, he's not, he doesn't get any real traction. And, um, but once he's there and he gets, you know, the Eisenhower response and the Kennedy response and things of this nature. Um, but he writes about bird in his own books. So I would say very aware 
And, but I think he wanted more. You could tell he was frustrated with where things were at in relation to our knowledge about uh, these different land masses. And I think it started to occur to him that he was being intentionally flustered and that his work was being intentionally derailed, much like Velikovsky's work in the same era, because, uh, or Morris Jessup, because it doesn't fit. Just like when they got rid of all these other things and were like, oh, the theory of relativity and forget about ether and forget, you know, forget about all these different pieces. Um, they, at a certain point, and I say they, you know, and it could be anyone from the Rockefeller um, institution, it could be anyone in the medical field, they want one particular answer. I mean, look at everything that happened in relation to the COVID op. They didn't want you even thinking about another thing. It's just but one solution. That's it. You can't think about anything else. <laughs> and if you do, you're the worst type of person on the planet. And um, so there's still that mentality. And, you know, they did it with um, the Ukraine Russian war as well, because one of the things they did immediately is they said, you know, we're going to suspend <laughs> our policy about hate speech and you can say anything you want about Russians, you know, and you can like threaten them or whatever. I'm mean, just insane. So um, these people don't, the controller elite, they don't have any central core. You know, I remember reading H.P. Alberelli's book about the higher echelon of the CIA. One of their sayings is that there is no truth. Think about living like that. You know, the, the only thing is about your ability to dominate in a particular scenario, that there is no truth. There's definitely truth. And um, so it breeds this kind of illness that you see with the World Economic Forum and others, I think. <laughs> That's a long way to answer your question, but it's true. Yeah. Mark A. Gernon, uh, why did they, they, in quotes, scrap the moon land material and data? That always bothered me. There's no question. Well, and this is the weird thing because you get caught in different places, you know, in the alternative media or the pseudo alternative media, whatever you want to call it, the arising media, they don't understand things like UFOs or they think that uh, anything that talks about the moon landing other than the official version is, um, you know, conspiracy talk and like, oh, you know, uh, it's not. The thing is, you can simultaneously agree that we went to the moon, but say when we got there, first of all, we used totally different type of technology, one, and two, when we got there, we found ruins and it wasn't, you know, anything that they wanted to reveal. And three, maybe there are other reasons why we couldn't go back. Um, those things are completely fundamentally provable based on a trail of data, incidents, and all the rest. And the fact that nobody's gone back to the moon in 50 years. So when I hear people saying we didn't go to the moon and here's the, the reasons why, I actually am more sympathetic to their argument because there have been things that have been so deeply obfuscated. So, uh, but it freaks out, you know, uh, certain types of people to even think that way. And they're like, oh, you're, it's a conspiracy theory, you know. And the problem is the truth is somewhere in the middle, <laughs> which is uh, we certainly had the ability to go to the moon, but the way it's portrayed, they could have very, very easily filmed a lot of that. It's very possible um, because they didn't have the ability really to shoot at that quality and detail on the moon, which they weren't familiar with at all. So I think some of these things can come out without unraveling the entire truth. If, you know, uh, there is a number of intelligent people who feel we didn't go at all. The problem with that is that we have an extensive space, secret space network. And, um, you know, if they took 50 years off of the space program and didn't do anything with it, then that doesn't make any sense. You know, they definitely built the space infrastructure, which means they're deep in space now, uh, for sure. Yes. Um, uh, I, I'd never heard of this. George Ivankovich says, what about the lost footage found in a rundown McDonald's? Do you know about this? <laughs> uh, I remember the broadcast that were intercepted uh, part. I don't know about the, the McDonald's thing, but if you want to email it to me, admin at darkjournalist.com. Fascinating. Would be perfect for that. Uh, I want to remind everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist show. This is X series 129. We've gone deep tonight into the hot zone through the figure of Albert Einstein and uh, scientist Charles Hapgood, 
We're taking your questions now. We're going to continue to take your questions for another 15 minutes or so. And um, I want to remind you to go to darkjournalist.com and sign up for a newsletter. If you haven't already, that's a free newsletter. And it keeps us in touch regardless of all the incredible censorship. And by the way, we have great stuff coming up for the rest of the summer. So you don't want to miss it. Okay. Hang on. <laughs> all right. Um I really want to ask this question. So Silver Fox says, I think they already punched through to this realm and we're witnessing it now. What do you think? Um, well, you mean they interdimensional yes. beings or aliens? Yeah. Um, well, there's too many, uh, like this is something that's interesting about the UFO field. If you go back like 20 years, it's all about cases. And so somebody would have a case, somebody would be driving along a highway late at night and they'd get abducted. Or, um, you know, somebody would discover they had been abducted as a child and it went on for their whole life. And there's a whole kind of saga associated with it. Um, so there are some incredible cases like the Betty and Barney Hill is sort of the foundational case in all that. Now, later, that whole script gets changed upside down. Now, those stories were being passed down through generations. So that somebody's grandfather or great-grandfather and grandmother, um, they could have UFO stories and um, it would be part of the family lore. It's part of the family history. So there's a, a kind of an understanding about what this thing is. Then what happens is after 9-11 and all the militarization of thing they really had knocked out the UFO file interest dramatically. And what you were left with were um, really kind of crazy <laughs> stuff. And they starved that field out and then they came back in and militarized it so that now when we talk about it, uh, even tonight, we have to talk about it from the point of view of what they're trying to do to militarize it. So they've really done something remarkable there. But when we think of the actual subject matter, we have a huge mystery sitting in the middle of uh, humanity and it's not explained. We've dealt with it through generations. People have researched it, you know, Leonard Stringfield, Stanton Friedman, they've lived and died going through all this. So, um, you know, we're definitely at a place and at a point where we need to find out the truth around these things. And when I'm looking at it, I'm seeing um, that the mystery schools provide a setup for us to understand the interdimensional aspects and that there is an acknowledgement in there that there are other beings that we're operating, operating with. The problem is you get so much imagination on one hand and then disinformation on top of it that we lose a lot of the real stories. So it has to be gone about in a very careful fashion. And I think a lot of those people early on set the, the stage for John Keel very, I mean, those books are still <laughs> absolutely fascinating. So if they could do that kind of research in the 70s and 80s, then that's the road, I think, where we're getting answers. This other stuff, the like, hey, the Tic Tac can do 1,400 Gs or, you know, that's crazy, like, CIA aggression weirdness. It has nothing to do with anything. And um, you're not going to get any answers that way. As a matter of fact, um, giving them, you know, a kind of free hand to molest the public with a UFO threat is irresponsible. Yes. PM Chan says, yes, I remember them finding all the video footage in an abandoned McDonald's in Florida. <laughs> I guess this was around 15 years ago. You got to send yeah. that to me. Okay. You <laughs> and uh, Mouse It says, any audio engineer will tell you the Apollo 11 broadcast came from Earth orbit. Uh, math is a hell of a drug. <laughs> I believe it. I mean, there's also weird things about the Nixon call to the astronauts. There was something bizarre going on. You know, uh, one of the things I mentioned to uh, Dr. Farrell the last time he was here, we were talking about blackmail on the Russian side against the U.S. and how that goes all the way back. You know, they're very aware and did their own investigations around the Kennedy assassination and all these deep state moves to change policy, you know. Uh, Watergate, the moon landing and all the rest. And it's probably kind of a basket of blackmail that gets brought to the table one side or the other. Um, you know, there's very strange stories about the Russian space program and astronauts dying on the moon. 
their astronauts dying on the moon and that being covered up as well. So, yeah, I mean, we're <laughs> once you get, you know, this is why the Antarctica thing is so interesting because it's, it's problematic. We need to study it, but there's no way to study it. Uh, certainly through the work of Hapgood and that legacy that's been left for us. Um, we have some idea, but there's a real big problem with that. Whereas the hot zone is something, <laughs> although it's a geopolitical hotbed and surrounded by smugglers and, you know, smugglers blues and, <laughs> uh, you know, drugs and arms and all this stuff, you can still get into the hot zone. I mean, things still get out, uh, and it's a lot more accessible. So <laughs> I want to know things about Antarctica, but the hot zone presents itself as a, as a much more accessible opportunity uh, that we might get some deep answers on. Yes. George Bankovich just sent you Excellent. all the information on that. So that's waiting for you when the show's over. I can't wait. Yes. Um, so Mariana Alexa wants to know, DJ, please explain Spielberg's connection to the file. Then Oh, he's brought forward i mean they wanted they've wanted um filmmakers they wanted kubrick just for the moon landing part but they want them for other reasons and it's an incredible asset to have those masters of illusion on their side or master influencers or if you want to control the way people think about a particular thing there's no doubt that you want a really excellent film director um and he might think i mean I can't speak to anything about Spielberg because somebody who's a real Hollywood expert would show, you know, all this kind of dark stuff around him. What I'm trying to point out more is that when he was invited, for example, to show ET at Reagan's white house and afterwards Reagan said, we all know this is nonfiction. Um, and there was that, you know, commiserating about it. And I think that they shared information with the Reagan uh, administration shared with Spielberg, but the Carter administration also had a deep uh, interest in UFOs and a deep program about it. So they shared information with Spielberg for close encounters. There's no doubt about it. This is the interesting thing. The idea of sharing what this is has come up a number of times. There's sixties disclosure. They decided no way, right? They shut down everyone in relation to it. And they shut down Blue Book and all that phony CIA stuff. Um, then in the 70s, you had close encounters. You had these UFO waves. They thought, you know, uh, maybe we can control this. And then they pulled back dramatically from the people they were working with. But they got what they were able to do is they got a lot of data, you know, uh, in relation to that. So people's responses to it. And they sanctioned studies, of course, going back to the 60s about how the public would react to ET. And I'm sure they've worked very closely with religious authorities about it. But they've also said to themselves, how do we benefit? We know it. We know all about it. We've studied the stuff. But how do we benefit by letting it out? And one of the ways that they think that they can benefit is through the threat aspect and through the God aspect, which is you know, them as gods. That's probably the World Economic Forum. And the threat piece, which is the world emergency thing. You know, I bring up the emergency continuity of government um, piece because, for example, Biden, who came here to Somerset, Mass., <laughs> uh, and he gave a uh, speech about global warming and said, we are in an emergency and I'm going to do executive orders based on an emergency. So you have no power through Congress. You are operating at 27% in, in favorable polls, probably more like 20, <laughs> 19, 20% popularity, uh, your inflation is through the roof, you have disasters in foreign policy, and you can't tie your shoes, but you're going to have emergency powers, and that'll give you all this ability to do this stuff. It's the only way these groups can govern. Look to our friends in Canada. This guy cannot govern, and he got in literally through the power of them being able to arrange 20,000 votes in a particular area. And his, pop his own popularity, uh, speaking about Trudeau, <laughs> Castro Trudeau. And this guy is, you know, operating with like 20% or something. You can't govern with that type of low popularity. So they need emergency powers. That's why you have Van Herc talking about UFOs in relation to COG. That's never been done. It's never happened. I can tell you that because I've been watching for it for a long time. And now that they're talking about it, even though he's saying, well, I don't think it's aliens, he's still saying, we're watching UFOs. So all they have to do is magically change 
one of those UFOs they're watching into a threat and you know that's an emergency. So um, the emergency powers are unchecked and the citizenry and their representatives in Congress need to change that situation because we already saw what they did with emergency powers with the COVID op and it wasn't pretty when they destroyed the economy and kept people in their houses and all that nonsense. Yes. There is a lot of discussion tonight. <laughs> Back to McDonald's. I know, there was a footage. lot of discussion tonight <laughs> in the I thought Kentucky room. Fried Chicken was I know, a big one. All about right. pole shifts. And ah. I, I think it's this meme that's coming back around. So um, we know Casey mentioned a possible pole shift. Yes. Uh, what was the time period around that? Well, um, it's interesting because he talked about them in history as well. And one of the things when he talks about dinosaurs, by the way, um, the Casey readings give support to the idea of something like these images because what he was talking about was the beasts, large dinosaurs overrunning the earth, 50,722 BC. Now, traditional history has the dinosaurs dying off in uh, 65 million BC. That's a pretty big difference. How do you account for that? And I mean, is, was Casey just completely wrong, like that kind of wrong? It doesn't, it doesn't add up because so much of what he said about Atlantis has come to pass. And there's a lot more to find out. But um, so let's take it from this point of view. At one point, he suggests, you know, these beasts came about as part of their own undoing in Atlantis that they had kind of manufactured them. He's, he almost talks like he's talking about a DNA lab. So maybe it's a Jurassic Park situation where you have these dinosaur DNA hanging around the Atlanteans, like reanimate the dinosaurs and have a big problem. But what he says is that they create a gigantic death ray and that they are using this and that uh, by using that death ray to try to eliminate these animals, they set off volcanic eruptions and all the rest. And what actually happens, it doesn't eliminate the animals, but the dinosaurs, but um, the poles shift and that gets rid of them somehow. So this is, you know, Casey's suggestion there, but obviously there's some leftover piece of dinosaurs. And it looks like in those pictures, <laughs> one of the researchers who was looking at this was saying, you know, if you look enough at that situation of images, you will see that they're kind of holding the dinosaurs like pets. And so it's almost like, you know, the way people interact with their dogs or something. So um, was there a leftover piece? Was that expunged whenever it came up? And archaeologists would be like, well, I don't want to be made fun of, so I'm not going to even mention this. Um, there are tons of archaeological anomalies that don't ever make it into the history books. For example, if you look at some of those early Mayan pictures, you see white guys with beards. <laughs> uh, that doesn't make any sense. So where do they come from? And um, in, right in the middle of that, you have the Mormon story about the lost tribes of Israel coming over. And um, they never asked Casey point blank about whether Joseph Smith's Mormon story held any validity, but he did back them up dramatically in terms of the story of the lost tribes coming over and landing in Mexico. So, um, you know, when Jerusalem's being sacked and they take off, they go across the Atlantic. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot easier, and it was demonstrated that anyone could get across the Atlantic in those days. It was not that hard. And, you know, the Phoenicians or whoever could do it. And so, um, so in some ways, the Casey readings give some background to the Mormon story. The Mormon story is also interesting because uh, it contains an entire history. It's got stages of time, and some of it goes back so far that it's like an echo of Atlantis. But in the middle of it is this kind of almost Pleiadian, uh, you know, sort of blonde-haired, angelic thing, and there's a whole space thread in it as well. So I think we need to understand that better and what's going on there exactly. Because <laughs> uh, it seems damn Pleiadian if you're aware of that kind of material. I'm going to test Gigi that one. Yes. Scruples, 4444. Um, a great many people ha have been suicided for being associated with UFO file. What is oh, yeah. DJ's take on who of the most well-known are besides Forrestal? Hmm. 
I mean, if you look at um, Morris Jessup, the there's a Men in Black component to it. There's a advanced technology component to it. There's a UFO component to it. One of the books that he had written, um, which is way before Von Daniken or Ancient Aliens or anything, is UFOs in the Bible. And um, so he was giving the whole sweep of history. But here's somebody who's an astronomy professor. He's an archaeologist. He's a UFO writer. You know, he has so many different things in his background that he's very hard to repudiate. And um, if he was, what happens with his book is it gets annotated and all these strange technology pieces are in the annotations and then that gets sent to the Navy and they put him on a crisscross radar of this x group because not only is he talking about UFOs, but he's getting right into that X-technology. So um, that whole story about who was making the annotations and how that special version of his book was getting around gives us, I think, a really big hint. Um, I think that President Kennedy's uh, assassination was related to the UFO file. I don't think there's any doubt about it. It was the biggest secret that we had, and he wanted to share it with the Russians. Um, and the group that was keeping it was like, you know, infiltrated <laughs> by former Nazis at NASA and they didn't want anything to do with the Russians. So they just fought a huge war with, but also I think in terms of central control, they were like, we can run the world with this stuff from space. Why do we want to share it with them? So, um, I think that gives you incredible motivations. Um, so and Forrestal's in a line with Kennedy. They're the ex-share uh, theme. Um, but I think James McDonald is another one. If you really study it, um, there's a lot of unusual uh, deaths in relation to going into the UFO field. And I will say this too, which is, you know, it comes up uh, just like when there were the holistic doctors assassinations. And um, I knew someone who knew one of those holistic doctors who he didn't die he got away and he went to texas and sort of hid out but um he felt like he was on their radar and he probably was and whatever it is that was going on with those holistic doctors they were knocking them out and it all happens uh before these medical emergencies there's something strange about that there's something strange about the banker deaths when everybody was getting tossed out a window and when i talked to um Secretary Fitz about it, you know, Catherine said, well, you know, it's deleting databases. This is what they're doing. Think about that. Uh, and she knows that world quite well, but it makes sense. Yes. Andy B. DJ, was Einstein in a mystery school? I'm sure, uh, you know, with his interest in theosophy, that's the doorway. But um, the fact that he came from Germany and then there he is set up at Caltech, which um I want to recommend if you want to understand that part, watch the video that I did on the sun King and it's all occult imagery and Akhenaten and worship of the sun deity Aten uh, there at Caltech. And the fact that when Einstein goes there, uh, they, they attempt to assassinate him. I think that that says a lot as well. They didn't want him in there. So, but that is a deep mystery piece. Okay. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist program. We're going to take two more questions. Okay. And uh, I want to remind you to go to darkjournalist.com, sign up for our newsletter, and also make sure that um, you are watching what's coming up here because we have some fascinating shows for you. And basically, uh, you'll get the newsletter every Friday, and uh, it's free, but you, you're going to want to stand up and be counted with the incredible uh, interviews and shows that we have coming up for you. And um, we have some great documentaries that are going to be mind-blowing as well. So, uh, And in terms of events, you'll hear about them first if you're in that newsletter. So make sure you sign up at darkjournalist.com. And uh, we already appreciate so much uh, support. You know, somebody out there said GC Math. It's interesting because so many of the holistic doctors um, were associated with that GCMF and um, they were the ones who ended up dead. And the story that I remember following the most, the most unusual death was Dr. Bradstreet. It's very telling. 
I think. Um, but absolutely tragic. And I want to say this, that when we have things like that, which happen, uh, occasionally you'll hear people say, well, you know, the alternative field makes hay about anyone who dies, you know. Um, if it happens in a kind of a, a template fashion, you know, if it happens in a pattern like that, like, as they did with the holistic doctors, et cetera, it's incumbent upon any reporter anywhere and any researcher to get to the bottom of those things, even if it's an old story, um, to understand, you know, what are the dynamics that are involved? And, you know, unless you can get to the truth around these things, then, you know, you have to investigate to get to the truth. And so the idea, oh, you know, you can't talk about that or, you know, so-and-so passed away, you know, just don't even talk about it. No, you can't. If you're a reporter, you'll investigate it. And if you find nothing, then you can report that, you know, and you have to be sensitive and professional. And I agree with that, but uh, it's absolutely crucial, um, you know, that we get anytime there's a block on information and anytime there's like a, Hey, don't do that. No, it doesn't work like that. That's the whole reason we're in, you know, dark journalism or alternative media, <laughs> you know, you want to get to the truth. That's the whole point. You can't do it in the mainstream. So what are you going to do? Deal with a whole new range of blocks around the truth? No, the idea is get to the truth and then deliver that truth. Yes. George Ivankovich again, was Einstein part of the Cosmos Club? Um, you know, I don't have Einstein in the Cosmos Club, but it seems like there must be some kind of deep track record of him being in the Cosmos Club. So I could have missed it when I did that original uh, episode. I found some incredible high-ranking scientists and so many related directly around the UFO file that it would seem like a mighty oversight uh, that he wasn't. So I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. Yes. Okay. Karen Carpenter, have any of Casey or Steiner's work been edited or suppressed? Well, no, here's the thing with the Casey work. The Atlantis aspect is not uh, promoted because I think they think it freaks out their core audience. And um, so I like the ARE. Uh, you know, I think they're people who've done a good job holding up the Casey legacy. But at the same time, I'm also like, you know, <laughs> I would do it a lot differently. I think the Atlantis work is some of the most cutting edge work that's ever been put out there, period. And look, here's Casey's version. The two eye stone ran a civilization very much like our own, but more advanced. And um, that the height of that civilization went down in the hot zone. You know, this is what he put on the record in the 20s and 30s. So uh, at what point does it become okay to talk about it? So if I were them, I'd promote that stuff a lot more. Um, and I, I want to say for the record that only 20 some odd percent of the readings are out there in book form. You can get um, through the association, the entire library. They used to offer a CD, now it's online. And that's fascinating, what a journey that is. Um, and always great, I think, to have the Casey work. In terms of Steiner's work, there's still translations of work fundamentally, uh, I think, most, I've always felt in my own researchers, uh, researchers that the this is a hard way to put it. I feel like we have put, uh, there's something that's vouchsafed for us from all of those mystery schools by coming into this period. And I think part of it, I'm already feeling that with the work that we're doing with some of the other work that's come forward, uh, you know, with Farrell's work, with Gigi Young's work. There's, some, there's a wave in here. You know, when we started, um, doing the X series some four years ago, there was nothing in alternative media about Steiner. People understood it and had read the books, but it wasn't just wasn't around. It was like oblique or, you know, it was rarefied. And I think what happened was, you know, we brought the concepts through and then people like Gigi Young were able to expand on the eighth sphere, Aramon and all the rest. And uh, I'm delighted that, you know, because we have this back and forth. And so many of you have written to me in the ideas room and said, here's my experience with this stuff. Now we really have something going because I feel like that whole piece was vouchsafed. And, um, you know, Steiner had said to Hilma F. Clint that she should, you know, she was this incredibly influential painter. And he said to her, your, your stuff won't be understood for 50, 75 years. So don't even let it out. 
So he knew there's a whole thing about this, which is setting the tone for the 21st century. And I think that's where we are. And that's what we're doing with the ex-degonography series as well. Great question. Go ahead. Nijat Madri, are the Templars players in the story? There's evidence of them crossing the Atlantic. Oh, they are. There's a whole, um, right here in Massachusetts, there's a portrait of a Templar and they have it by a power station now and it's in rock. And um, then in Rhode Island, they have them and they came here. As a matter of fact, the, the term America comes from the Templars and you, it ha you have to go deep to get that one, but it's, it's a fact. And they were here and they were operational and they were doing a temple setup and all the rest of it. And what's interesting is um, the Templars are, are kind of a mixed group. Again, it's like the Belial Amelius thing because you have truly remarkable um, spiritual passion in what they're doing and there's a mystery element to it but then there's also something that gets in there these wild stories of what they were doing and the kind of rituals that they were doing so it's hard to parse what was going on there but they certainly came over here as uh, the benefit of a mystery school and uh, try to set something up here um and what is that remarkable money pit thing up there in Canada? Uh, I'm trying to think of that. But I've always there's a big Templar connection with this, uh, and I know someone in the ideas room is going to get this. But you know, there's a piece you can feel that. Well, setup. you mean the thing that people know there's treasure there and they can't get to it? <laughs> yes, the system I, I, is set up. Oh man, oak something. Yes, yeah, exactly. Island, Oak Island, right? Mystery of Oak Island, exactly. And they've done a lot of programs on it and stuff, and not all of them are very good, but uh, there's no question the sophistication involved, it's kind of like the labyrinth set up in Greek times. You know, you have to kind of go through this thing. What's interesting is some of the earliest uh, people who discovered it, they discovered it because there were lights hanging out there at night. So what's that about? <laughs> uh, forget about Skinwalker Ranch, right? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, this is a really interesting question. Um, so Mithraism, a Persian religion with many hidden ritual symbols, any connection with the hot zone? Yeah, there's all kinds of um, very, very strange setups. And the Mithraic piece is also has that connection with Persian mythology. So when we get into like, Ahura Mazda and Araman and the Mithraism, the crossover is gigantic. Uh, and this, you know, there's a thing involved in the Mithraism. It's so close. It's so similar to Christianity, but it's early and it has uh, lower elements in it, you know, like they sacrifice a bull and things of that nature. So, um, but the stories around it and the imagery around it are absolutely fascinating and I think that before um, the, that Amelia's Christ Golgotha uh, piece that Anthroposophy discusses and that we know, you know, the crucifixion, this whole, the whole mystery tradition was different. And then um, once Christ had achieved this level, then the whole thing changed and went back up to a point that it hadn't been since Atlantean times when according to in Casey's work now Christ is Amelius you know come back so it goes pretty deep um, but I would say what's interesting and what might open up some doors when we look at this is that um, Casey says that at a certain point humanity before 200,000 BC had both sexes in one and then when the separations happened we were able to move forward dramatically and that those separations were organized by Amelius. And um, so this part of the Casey cosmology and that piece is tied in directly with all the super interest around Atlantis. And when you see all the freaky, you know, disregard for gender in our own period um, and not by individuals, but by political groups using it as a football, then you start to understand, Oh, they know that, you know, if they can eliminate the gender identification, then uh, they can hold that power for themselves. And that gets us back to a Casey story where he talks about these things, which are like these Atlantean cyborgs, which were sexless. 
And they were at the behest. There was no line for them. They didn't reproduce. They were the slave race for the Atlanteans. And in fact, when he talks about Atlantis going down and the Atlanteans coming into Egypt, the biggest problem is they come in with all these things. And um, so, <laughs> and that's for another show, but wow, you know, the, these are the, this is the echo of the period in the transhumanism that we're in. I, I got to say this. So Najat says, I'm collecting U.S. coins, and there are tons of Mithraic symbolism on so many of them. Mm. And I wonder, by having all those symbols, could that be some kind of magic spell on the currency? Who knows? Fascinating, huh? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure that they do. I'm sure that they do. And they know those rituals. As a matter of fact, I think that we should take our own time um, with rituals. And if you know uh, certain types of people, you know, they'll bless their food. They bless this. They're, there's those opportunities for ceremony with things. Uh, so I, 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 I highly, rec I think that adds to the super impact of the whole thing. All right, we'll take one more question. Well, actually, that just reminded me of the King Tut sandals that we just saw that I showed you. Yes. And how they're in, everything in Egypt is magically imprinted. Yes. Right? So he, there he is. He's walking on images. So he's receiving a magic spell with every footstep, right? True. So it just, you know, this, this is ancient. Right? Oh, there's, there's no doubt about there. it. There's no doubt about it. I absolutely agree. And, um, you know, every mystery school tradition has something about charging your food. And uh, sometimes that's just having a good attitude towards it. I don't even think you don't have to be a member of a mystery school. I'm just saying that's part of it. You know, it's, it's pretty interesting that that the understanding and the blessing of food, you know, creates that whole window. I've often said that they use very occult esoteric practices when it comes to things like, you know, like Amazon, for example, when they do the, can we serve you, you know? So they know that service is a part of the power of that exchange. Problem is the reason that they're doing it, the reason that they're gaining this dominance. And we know that they don't treat their employees very well at all. That said, when I hear about things like Starbucks unions and Amazon unions, I think it's a total ginned up thing. And uh, I think that they're making a phony thing. They're going to create a little spat and then say like, oh, well, we came to the table and we gave them this and that. I don't even think that that uh, those union pushes are real. But if they are, um, then I think that they they should, you know, definitely be, you know, there should be real legislation protecting people working in those environments. And, you know, knowing how the corporate masses operate, when we think about Apple and the workers and why they signed on to this horrible thing in the mid nineties to ship all our jobs overseas was because they were like, Hey, we can get, you know, incredible profits. And, um, it wasn't all bad, but the problem is those people, they had them working 18 hours a week in these factories. And then what did they do when they started jumping out windows? They've created nets around the windows. They didn't give them time off or give them a psychologist to talk to. They were just like, Hey, there's a net. So you don't, <laughs> you know, jump out the window. I mean, so this is, you know, this is who you're dealing with when you're dealing with corporate America on that world economic forum level. Not everyone is like that, but it seems like in order to get up the ladder, you have to conform to that. So that needs to be under a microscope in this culture because they're trying to force the conformity. And what they're trying to do is anyone who's an individual becomes the outsider. They're the conspiracy theorist. You know, they're the anti so and so, whatever it happens to be, they need to eliminate that person. It's become so much like the prisoner, uh, the 60s show. And <laughs> I mean, it was kind of like, you know, you got to wonder, was that just a prediction? It seems like it. Okay, last question, Miss Olivia. It's not a question. I just wanted to say today, um, I know people have different opinions about it, but um, I watched Russell Brand put out his half hour interview with Vindana Shiva, who is. So refreshing, so wise, uh, so intelligent. And it, it was, um, you know, she really has a plan for how we can beat the globalists. Oh, she's great. Yeah. She, uh, <laughs> she's very interesting. What else did you want to say? I just want to recommend it for everybody because, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of obviously concern and despair and stuff. And I felt so reassured just knowing she's on the planet 
the way she, oh, her understanding yeah. of the yes. paradigm, it's a consciousness paradigm. I think being Indian is part of this. Yes. And, and being a woman is part of it, understanding soil and agriculture the way that she does, and the earth is a living being, and us and the interconnectivity of all life. And I just wanted to recommend to everyone to check her out because we really need to understand the, um, how we got here and who, and when we understand it, we can invest in people who understand the problem properly, right? And you cannot, uh, you cannot, this is Einstein's quote. I didn't plan on this, but you know, you can't solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it, yeah. right? Wow. And that's it. That's it. That is one of the great ones too. Uh, oh, I highly agree with that completely. Um, well, also, you know, those Eastern cultures have seen the incredible ravaging of the farmers and the destruction of the economies and things like that in a way that, that we haven't. We're starting just to notice it now. Um, you know, with that thing that we just, you know, we're talking about with the Amish, um, you know, what they want is that centralization and control and uh, they may have overreached to get it, and it's our job to really bring things back uh, to that. And I think you do it in a positive way. There's no question about it. And um, it's not just about a big complaining game. It's about what kind of solutions, of course, do we bring to the table, but we need to understand the problem. And, um, you know, this is what I think we get to so much with the interaction that we have here in the ideas room that we're all, you know, nobody's as smart as all of us. And so we're all getting a piece of this. And uh, tonight, the pole shift piece and how it's back there, these people are, are working with it somehow. And they're aware of it. It may even be the reason why they're speeding up at this breakneck speed. Maybe they anticipate a pole shift. Maybe they're wrong. Maybe they're right. Uh, but we need to get our own kind of central understanding of this. And I think some of the figures... Um, that we talked about tonight, like Hapgood, Casey, uh, give us that insight. And um, we take that and we adopt it for the period and the place and time that we're in. And uh, it's very interesting. You know, it's, a, it's quite a period in time because the opportunities are just as great as the perils. And uh, that's the way I look at it. So we'll do a few shout outs before I go. But Miss Olivia, super chat. Okay. I would like to thank Bobo the Clown, uh, <laughs> Undestroyer, Gil and Joy R, Friendly Magus, Global Atlantis, Stephen, Doreen Hewitt, George Gould, Mark Lane, Berm Baumgartner, uh, Donald Smead, Brian Berner, Eurythmies Fun, Robert Mathurin, W.C. Ray, Debbie McAdoo, McMurphy321, Jay Vandervest, Dantic Lichtenstein, uh, Jim <laughs> Sarge 3ID, James Cregan, Jay Liebgott, Shazam, and Thomas Tyson. Thank you so much. Wow, fantastic. We so appreciate your support. And uh, to all our subscribers, you know, you help us to deliver exactly what we need to do. We couldn't do it without you. And uh, we're always aware of that fact. And uh, we're working for you. And uh, so many great people out there tonight. <laughs> I'll do a couple of quick shout outs. Doyle Wayne, sir. It's good to see you. Let's see if I can get my my chart thing to work here. Mikhail Groom. It's great to see. Well said. Thank you. I forget what I said, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, Miss Olivia, it's great to have you back. Congratulations. A great night. Don't forget to like, I like that. Silver Fox. Absolutely. 100% important. <laughs> I never remember that stuff. What's wrong with me? Nance Hardwick, thank you very much. She says, thank you, DJ and Olivia. And do a couple more of these here. Scruples, hey. <laughs> thank you for another fab show, DJ, bless you. Bless you too. You've been with us for a long time, sir. Najat, it's always great spending Friday nights with you guys. Absolutely. It's great to see you out there. Fantastic. Traveling Riverside. Hi. <laughs> it's nice to see you. Fantastic. Golden Girl. Ideas Room. Ideas Room rules. Don't forget it. Rocking tonight. Exactly. Yeah, the questions were outstanding. Mm -hmm. Everybody was just. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the Einstein thing, really, it goes deep. So I can picture us revisiting a lot with this. But Hapgood is crucial. I think very important. Big influence on Graham Hancock, I discovered. 
Um, Christine Laurel, the opportunities are as, oh, that's my quote. That's great. Thank you. I really like the perspective. The opportunities are as great as the perils. There's no question about it. Um, we're both right on that. <laughs> Ms. Tree, thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to see you. Let's get a thousand. Yes. I don't know what it is, but a thousand. I want them. <laughs> yep. I like that one. Sometimes short and sweet is good. We all love you, DJ and Olivia. Great show. Thank you, Silver Fox. Kate Garcia, another great show. Another good show, DJ and Olivia. Thank you. Roosevelt, I see you out there, sir. Sean Walker. Okay. Yes, Graham got to go with his lovely wife, all the greatest spots in the world. She is remarkable. I got the chance to meet her. Great uh, photographer and... Um, you know, just really helping Graham out with, with everything and just very deep like Graham. It was fantastic to meet them both. Wolf, we love you. We will be back with you next Friday and uh, we might have some special reports between now and then. It depends on how things break, but um, we'll see you back Friday at 8 p.m. and uh, we'll be here with X Series 130. Uh, remember to hit that um, darkjournalist.com and make sure you're signed up and we will see you all next week. Have a great weekend everyone. It's terrific to be here with the Ideas Room and uh, Miss Olivia? David Tormina just told us that he has two new puppies so <laughs> congratulations and mazel tov. Oh that's great. Wow fantastic. Well you know it says end broadcast but it never really really ends. Thanks, everyone. God bless. In the hot zone we go.